homework. Gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. China's business confidence has fallen to its lowest level since January of 2013, according to a survey by World Economics on Monday, reflecting the impact of surging COVID cases on economic activity with the abrupt lifting of many pandemic control measures. The index fell to 48.1 in December from 51.8 in November, the lowest since the survey began in 2013. The results were among the first indicators of how business sentiment has taken a hit in the world's second biggest economy after the sharp relaxation of strict COVID containment measures on the 7th of December, triggering a still growing wave of domestic COVID cases across China. World well, Economics said that the survey suggests strongly that the growth rate of the Chinese economy has slowed quite dramatically and may be heading for recession in 2023. China's GDP is expected to grow just 3% this year, its worst performance in nearly half a century. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The survey showed business activity fell sharply in December, with the sales managers' indexes in manufacturing and service sectors broke below the 50 level. China has recently dismantled some key parts of the world's toughest anti-COVID curbs and lockdowns. The measures were championed by President Xi Jinping, but impaired the economy and sparked popular protests unprecedented in its decade-long rule. The top leaders and policymakers will focus on stabilizing the economy in 2023 and stepping up policy adjustments to ensure key targets are met, according to an agenda setting meeting ending on Friday. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The French economy is set to slow sharply next year in the face of an energy price shock, but should recover some lost ground from 2024. That's according to the central bank that was forecast on Saturday, revising down its outlook slightly. The Eurozone's second biggest economy is on course to slow from 2.6% growth this year to only 0.3% in 2023. The Bank of France said in an update of its long-term economic outlook, trimming its 2023 forecast from 0.5% previously. However, with the outlook highly dependent on gas supplies, a recession could not be ruled out, adding that growth next year could be anywhere between minus 0.3% and 0.8%. That was lower than the 1% growth forecast the government has built into its 2023 budget, a target that a finance ministry official said remained confident was within reach. 
Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The central bank said that once the energy price crisis eases, growth was expected to pick up, reaching 1.2% in 2024 and 1.8% in 2025. Previously, it forecast 2024 growth of 1.8%. On inflation, the central bank estimated a peak in early 2023 and an average EU harmonised rate next year of 6%, followed by 2.5% in 2024 and 2.2% in 2025. The European Central Bank has raised its interest rates four times, most recently by 50 basis points on Thursday, as it seeks to contain surging price pressures. In light of the weak growth outlook, the Bank of France forecasts the budget deficit would widen from 5% of economic output to this year to 5.4% next year. The government expects it's an unchained fiscal shortfall. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Calcai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Italy is set to scrap part of its plans to facilitate cash payments for goods and services after criticism from European Union authorities, according to Economy Minister Giancarlo Giorgetti. In its draft 2023 budget, the government had proposed changing the current system in which sellers risk fines if they refuse to accept card payments by saying no penalties would be imposed for transactions below 60 euros. The move drew criticism from the European Commission, which said it was not consistent with previous EU recommendations to Italy to boost tax compliance. And Giorgetti told Parliament late on Sunday that the government had backtracked. The minister said that Italy intends to eliminate the measure on points of sales and some sort of compensatory measures may be introduced to help shopkeepers pay the commission fees on card transactions. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. But critics say that cash payments encourage tax dodges in a country where around 100 billion euros in taxes and social contributions are evaded every year, according to Treasury data. The current fines, which amount to 30 euros plus 4% of the value of the transaction, were one of the conditions for a 21 billion euro tranche on the EU's post-COVID recovery fund money that Rome secured in the first half of this year. Despite the latest developments, Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, who took office in October, continues to be the more indulgent towards cash than her predecessors. Her first budget, which must be approved by Parliament before year's end, raises a limit on cash payments to €5,000 from next year, up from a previous ceiling of 1000 Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. 
The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kelkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage from Kalkai Media. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine Media. Today's guest is Griffin Trelaw. He's a CFO and co-founder of Clooster. With the Ethereum merge scheduled for September, we're all looking for more insight into what's going to happen to the crypto space after this major event. In a volatile market, investors are keen to find guidance on direction of trades and cryptos to invest in, and it's important to do thorough research in market fundamentals and economic factors that could impact the markets. So as much information and insight we can gain into the space from experts will only help us in our own search for the best investments that we can find. So today's expert, Griffin Trelaw, is specialised in crypto analysis and will share insights from his business, Krista. Welcome to the show, Griffin. Hi, Sage. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure being here. Oh, thank you so much. Um, what are you noticing, if we can jump straight in? I know you're probably really busy. What are you noticing in the changes that are occurring leading up to the merge of ETH 2.0. It's been talked about for so long. Do you think things like gas fees should be decreasing after it happens and maybe the use of more layer two scaling solutions? That's a fantastic question and I agree with you. Yes, gas fees in theory after this upgrade uh, should theoretically decrease. However, the, the merge is simply just a consensus change from proof of work to proof of stake. For, for the viewers who, uh, who don't know what that means, uh, proof of work uses miners or a hash rate to validate chief consensus, whereas the proof of stake mechanism refers to the process of staking the native tokens of the network used as collateral by staking operators to achieve consensus. Now, roll-ups uh, essentially assist this scaling by compressing transactions into a single transaction and then posting that onto a layer one. I'm going to get a little more technical here, so please bear with me. Uh, after EIP4844, now EIP is an acronym for ETH Improvement Proposal, that essentially is to make the cost of roll-ups cheaper by making it less expensive to post proofs on the layer one. We have two brilliant articles on roll-ups uh, posted on Substack by Cluster Research that I'll happily post after this stream. Now, um, two examples of roll-ups are StarkNet and Optimism. StarkNet is a zero-knowledge roll-up that uses zero-knowledge proofs to compress these transactions, whereas Optimism is an optimistic roll-up that also uses fraud proofs to compress transactions. So, in theory, uh, gas fees will not really lower post-merge. This is actually a common misconception. The fees will be lowered through upcoming hard forks after the merge, which is going to allow for these hard forks to occur. Okay, thank you so much. Well, that's definitely clarified something for us. Now, you've inspired me with that. Has Ethereum ever had to transfer the maximum amount of transactions it's able to so far or is it still just theoretically a number that they've suggested that they're able to cope with on the blockchain at any one time so ethereum in its current state is doing more transactional volume than visa itself and that is while it's still using proof of work as we scale to proof of stake and this merge occurs in theory with upcoming hard forks it's theoretically possible for ethereum to scale up to 100,000 transactions per second or, or more. Uh, it's also these additional mechanisms that will be introduced, such as EIP-1559, uh, that will then make Ethereum deflationary. So 
in theory, the uh, if more transaction fees are being burnt than the block rewards generated, then the supply of Ethereum will be diminishing over time, therefore making it more and more scarce. Now, the purpose of this was to, to make Ethereum more deflationary in times of high network activity. As the merge occurs, it can then handle that network activity, making the asset a better overall investment as the uh, and as the meme says, it is ultrasound money in that sense. Yeah, ultrasound money. Wow, that's definitely a term that I've heard before, but I've never really understood it. So you believe it's the fact that it's becoming more deflationary and more useful as a mode of transaction. Is, is that correct? Correct, correct. This will all be allowed post-merge, and then as future hard forks are implemented, it will then allow Ethereum to start scaling more, handle more transactional volume and network activity, and then ultimately, if... Um, if transaction fees are, are being burnt, it also becomes deflationary too. So it's uh, it's an amazing asset. Uh, look at it like digital oil to, to the older generations that uh, are trying to wrap their head around this. Uh, it is going to power this next sort of digital economy, this financial system that moves online. And I, I honestly believe that Ethereum will be leading this charge. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, and it's not just the older generation who are trying to wrap their head around it. I'm trying to understand what's going <laughs> on here as well, trying to keep up. <laughs> so thank you for that. Now, what do you think will happen to the staked Ethereum that was previously required by the miners to use proof of stake consensus? How do you think this will impact its price? That's a very good question because I was looking into that myself recently. Now, the, the staked Ethereum won't actually be unlocked at the date of the merge, which I believe is intended to be around middle of September, September 15th. Um, the unlocking of the Ethereum will likely be six to 12 months later through a different upgrade. Um, in that sense, that could create some short-term volatility as Ethereum is released back into circulation. Uh, economics does dictate that as the supply increases, the demand should decrease. So. Um, that just sounds like another opportunity to, uh, to, to look at Ethereum if it does become cheaper and more supply into circulation. However, uh, I don't see that lasting too long before demand picks up again and the, uh, and the price of Ethereum rises with it. Okay, thanks for that. So moving along, what do you see as the main difference between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum? I heard you know, uh, mention hard forks earlier. That's when, if I understand correctly, another blockchain breaks off from a main blockchain such as Bitcoin. If you can clarify that in a moment, that'd be great. And how can people avoid being scammed by other similar sounding protocols such as Ethereum Classic to Ethereum? Okay, um, don't sell yourself short, Sage. You, uh, you know a little more than you think. So a, a hard fork is essentially you're, you're splitting the chain to allow for an upgrade. Now, uh, if we rewind back to the first half of that question, uh, Ethereum Classic, uh, that is the original chain which was forked following the DAO hack. There really isn't a risk of being scammed here. The only real risk is sending Ethereum Classic tokens uh, to an Ethereum address and, and vice versa, right? So. Ethereum Classic still uses a proof of work chain. I don't see that changing anytime soon, which of course will please the miners. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, miners are the one using uh, GPUs to, to, to validate these uh, transactions. It's a consensus mechanism and they then get paid um, uh, Ethereum or, or Ethereum Classic as new blocks are minted. Now, a, a better question might be why miners are, are forking the proof of work chain so they can still mine Ethereum post-merge. And that's likely so they still have a chain to mine on and don't have to move across to Ethereum Classic altogether. Essentially, after the merge, we'll have three types of Ethereum hard forks. We'll have Ethereum, ETH proof of work, and Ethereum Classic. So uh, if, if you want my expert opinion, I would go with Ethereum because it's the most robust and abundant chain. It has the most activity, it has the most developers, and therefore it makes sense to, uh, sorry, to, to follow the strongest chain moving forward. Wow, thank you very much for clarifying that. So it sounds like there's going to be a lot of Ethereum mining rigs that are going to go obsolete. Is that true? Do you have any insights to share on what's going to happen with those rigs? I mean, the, the rigs themselves can always switch to different cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum Classic. Uh, they're going to be keeping Ethereum proof of work as well, so they don't have to ditch the Ethereum chain altogether. There are other coins such as Ravencoin, which you can still mine. I believe that had a halvening uh, a year ago. So 
miners will still have many, many opportunities to continue mining coins and, um, and validating transactions as far as proof of work goes. Uh, ETH itself, you'll still have the option of, of mining it. However, the token itself will just, instead of, be call, uh, sorry, instead of being titled ETH, E-T-H, uh, it would be E-T-H-P-O-W for proof of work. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Um, so back to the mainline discussion. Is it true that Coinbase could halt Ethereum withdrawals the day of the merge? And how will this impact investors, please? Okay, so that's a standard practice with many, many exchanges that, uh, that follow these upgrades. So uh, yes, investors should still be able to trade on Coinbase itself. So the, the impact will be minimal. Like I said, it is a standard practice whenever a coin is doing an upgrade or a, or a rather mar a large upgrade at that. So why they do this is to just reduce the exposure to customers in the case, uh, sorry, in the case of something going wrong. And that way their assets won't get stuck or lost. It's more a preventative measure, if anything. Okay, thanks very much for that. So as we start to wind up the discussion, do you see Ethereum flipping Bitcoin as the largest crypto by marking cap in coming years? And do you have any tips for us on cryptos to keep our eyes on? For sure, for sure. So mm -hmm. uh, another great question. I, I am an ETH maxi. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it goes to say, yes, I do, I do believe that the Ethereum... Uh, market cap can eventually flip that of Bitcoins. Now, the reason I believe that is because it already has flipped Bitcoin on every other major metric except for price. Now, uh, flipping Bitcoin's market cap will probably happen last. And, and the reason for that is because ETH is always expanding. New protocols are being introduced. The, the innovation itself, network security and, and soon scalability. It's, it is the only cryptocurrency to inherently solve the blockchain trilemma, meaning that it's decentralized, secure and scalable. I, I don't know another cryptocurrency to date that can keep up with that. And um, like I said, it's the network that has the most activity on all fronts. It's the most secure and soon to be one of the most scalable, if not the most scalable. So if it's already hand handling the, the transactional volume of Visa and more, uh, who knows how much more volume it could handle uh, once this merge and future hard forks uh, occur moving forward. So yes, I'm, I'm uh, an ETH maxi for those reasons and uh, I do see it actually flipping Bitcoin's market cap uh, because it in effect solves the blockchain trilemma and that's why cryptocurrencies exist. Okay, thank you very much for that. And just before you go, any cryptos we should be keeping on our watch list as we enter the second half of this year? I knew there was something you'd want at the end of this. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there are a couple that I'm keeping my eye on. Obviously, I want to avoid um, anything relating to financial advice. However, um, a, a couple of cryptocurrencies I'm keeping my eye on are, uh, are GMX. Now, that's a, a decentralized derivatives exchange that pays fees to its holder. Another one is Matic or Polygon. Now, that is um, building scaling solutions for Ethereum and, and, and was one of the first to deploy a, a zero-knowledge roll-up. So you want to look for projects that, that complement the Ethereum ecosystem moving forward. Uh, another one is Synthetics, SNX. That's one of the first players in the DeFi space and, and following DeFi. Chainlink is another one you'd want to keep an eye on. That is the largest Oracle provider in all of crypto, which is a very important infrastructure that allows additional protocols to operate. Lastly, and, and following um, our talks of the NFTs and, and metaverse, I'd be keeping an eye on Mana, Decentraland, and uh, sorry, Decentraland, and Engine E N J. They are ETH-based metaverse coins, and, and obviously need no introduction. Following the um, the, the previous talks, and uh, as the metaverse keeps expanding, and, and big companies such as Meta plan on establishing themselves, uh, themselves in this metaverse, Mana and Engine are, are really sort of setting themselves up properly to, um, to benefit from this moving forward. So those would be the cryptocurrencies I keep an eye on. Uh, Ethereum would be the, 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 the most prominent of those five or six that I've mentioned. And then you do want to participate with some exposure to altcoins. However, um, the, the majority of your, of your portfolio should be allocated in the more established cryptocurrencies such as, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
Thanks so much, Griffin, for making time to appear on the show today. And as the bear does continue to swoop on the markets, uh, hopefully we're seeing all this institutional investment going into these coins and building up some great use cases for these crypto projects that hopefully we'll see in due time some excellent traction. I think the crypto market cap globally did increase today, so that's good news for people who are interested in the sector. Was well, there anything you'd like to add before you go? Yeah, buy, buy low, sell high. That's as, <laughs> that's as far <laughs> as the adage goes. Uh, as more and more institutions get into this space, uh, they will want cheaper prices. So use this time in the bear market to, uh, to learn how to trade, uh, understand the fundamentals underpinning the market. You will have plenty of time. And um, as far as the market cycles go, you, you do have the benefit of the Bitcoin halvening cycle that occurs every four years. Uh, we had the most recent one in, in 2020. The next one is scheduled for 2024. So you have at least two years to understand this market, uh, observe prices as they go through this bear market, providing better buying opportunities and really set yourself up to, uh, to benefit from that next halvening cycle, which will occur in 2024, 2025. Thanks so much, Griffin. Enlightening definitely was a word that sprung to mind during that discussion and really do appreciate your time. Likewise, thank you so much for having me here today, Sage. And if you just joined us, we had a very informative, stimulating discussion with Griffin Trelaw. He's a CFO and co-founder at Cluster. That's Q-L-U-S-T-E-R, if you're wondering. And you can catch the full interview at Calkine Media's YouTube channel. Please keep watching for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. As we come to the end of 2022, let's take a look at four UK listed star stocks that have gained heavily on a year to date basis as of the 13th of December 2022. First on the list is Medic Clinic International PLC. Medic Clinic shares gained nearly 56% on a year to date basis as of 13th December. The company expects increased client activity to drive further revenue growth, margin expansion and improved earnings in the 2023 financial year. In the financial year 2023, the company expects a combination of volume growth and efficiency gains to continue to drive the group towards the pre-pandemic profitability alongside a meaningful improvement in earnings. The group also expects the positive momentum in revenue growth margin improvement and earnings of the financial year 2022 to continue in the financial year 2023, driven by increased client activities supported by expected underlying economic growth in all three regions. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Next on the list is Shell PLC, which is engaged in oil and natural gas production. Shell shares gained nearly 35% on a year-to-date basis as of 13th December. Shell recently in December announced the pound sterling and euro equivalent dividend payments in respect of the third quarter 2022 interim dividend, which was announced on the 27th of October 2022 coming in at 25 cents US per ordinary share. The company is set to release its fourth quarter results and fourth quarter interim dividend announcement for 2022 on the 2nd of February, 2023. 
In November, Shell Petroleum NV, a wholly owned subsidiary of Shell PLC, reached an agreement with Davidson Kempner Capital Management LP, Pioneer Point Partners and SAMP Pension to acquire 100% shareholding of Nature Energy for nearly 2 billion US dollars. In April of 2022, Shell Overseas Investment BV signed an agreement with Actis Solenergy to acquire 100% of Solenergy Power Private Limited for $1.55 billion and with it the Spring Energy group of companies. Next on the list is BP PLC which is engaged in the global energy business. And BP shares gained nearly 33% on a year-to-date basis as of 13th December. Recently, on the 9th of December, BP confirmed the current status of its business and interests in Russia. The company said that on 27th of February 2022, BP's board decided that BP would exit its 19.75% shareholding in Rosneft and its other business in Russia. The company also added that the decision remains unchanged and BP has no intention of returning to business as usual in Russia. For the third quarter in nine months of 2022, the company reported that the debt was reduced to $22 billion while the company reported a loss for the quarter being $2.2 billion compared to the profit of $9.3 billion for the second quarter of 2022. In September 2022, BP announced that it agreed to sell its upstream business in Algeria to ENI, including its interest in the gas producing in Aminas and in Salah concessions. Lastly on the list today, Pearson PLC, which is a British multinational publishing and education company. Pearson's shares gained nearly 52% on a year-to-date basis as of 13th December. In October 2022, Pearson secured European private equity firm IK Partners as a subtenant at its global headquarters. In its 2022 nine-month trading update, the company said that the group's underlying sales are up 7%. Full year sales and adjusted operating profit expectations were reaffirmed. The company also said that they are on track to deliver at least £100 million sterling of efficiencies in 2023, which will accelerate improved margin expectations from 2025 through to 2023. Well, with that, we've come to the end of this video. Do let us know your thoughts in the comment section and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and also do press that bell notification to be sent upcoming videos. Thanks so much for watching. Sage for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Shares in Australia's star entertainment group tumbled nearly 12% on Monday after the New South Wales government proposed to raise taxes on casino poker machine operators in the state from July next year. The potential gaming tax changes, which will affect Star's operations in Sydney, which made up half of its revenue in fiscal 2022, according to its annual report, could raise an additional $364 million over the next three years if implemented. New South Wales Treasurer Matt Keane said on Saturday the money raised will be used to help fund vital services like helping communities recover from the impacts of COVID-19, bushfires and floods. The move comes amid increased efforts to reform Australia's gambling industry, which has been rolled in damning reports of sidestepping anti-money laundering rules, dysfunctional governance and poor corporate culture. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Star Entertainment Group said in a statement on Monday that it had not been consulted by the New South Wales government on the matter and that it is seeking to urgently engage with the government as to the sustainability of the proposed tax changes and the impact on the Star's business. 
The company's shares hit their lowest since April of 23rd, 2020. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Hoy Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calcine Media's crypto buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calcine Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calcai Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on Genus, a company started by an Aussie dad with a green app for kids that's been trialed in 40 schools. Today, I have with me the co-founder and director of Genus, John Owen. Welcome, John. Great to have you with us today. Thank you very much. So, John, could you tell us about Genus? What can you tell us about the app? Yeah, so we're addressing the most pressing issue of our time, you know, avoiding climate catastrophe. Now, what does that mean? It means that we're running out of time to save the planet. Unfortunately, our kids know this too. And they're a smart generation. They're highly engaged. They want to help, but they don't always know how. Plus, let's face it, sustainability has got a bit of an image problem. Kids see it as hard and boring or an adult problem. And uh, we basically want to change that. You know, so our app provides fun things for kids to do, online challenges, games, quizzes, that sort of thing. But the difference with Genus is that we send them out into the real world to perform real world missions that drive real world impact. This is about the kids saving the planet for themselves. It's about the future and it's about saving the planet for the generation with most at stake. Well, it sounds fabulous and very exciting for kids and parents also. Where did the idea come from? Uh, well, I was watching a documentary, a nature documentary with my kids, and there was a section about habitat destruction and climate change. And my kids asked me, why is it like this? And I answered that, you know, a lot of adults don't understand climate change and things like that, and some just don't care. And at that point, I was like, if the adults are like this, what chance do the kids stand? And at that point, we're, I was like, we've got to do something about this. The stakes are too high. So if we're going to engage kids in sustainability, you know, we need to make it fun. So I watched a, a TEDx talk about gaming to solve real world problems and all the pieces fell into place. You know, you've got to make it fun for them. They're a digital generation, so it's got to be online. So we introduced principles of gamification like awards, levels, competition, that sort of thing. But it has to mean something in the real world if anything is going to change. So we send them out to do these mini missions that have a positive impact on the planet. It's about rewarding the kids and it's about making it a positive journey. It's such an important issue of our time. Now, a recent survey by medical journal The Lancet of 10,000 children and other young people aged 16 to 25 years across 10 countries, and that was including Australia, found that 59% were very or extremely worried about climate change and 84% were moderately worried. So mm. what do you think about those figures? Well, it's clear there's a, a whole generation growing up worrying about the future of the planet. You know, as a dad, I'm not OK with that. You know, I don't want my kids growing up with this existential dread about the future. 
And that's exactly what Genesis is about. It's about giving them hope. It's about giving them agency. It's about showing them how they can take control and live more sustainably. So, yeah. Now, let's just talk about financials if we can. Now, you have some raised plans. You're looking for around 800,000. What do you expect to do with these funds? Uh, essentially, it's all about taking us to the next stage. You know, we've made a great start. We've built an engaging platform full of amazing activities and loads of curriculum aligned resources for you know teachers to apply lessons in school. Um, uh, but we need to develop our product even more. You know, we want to introduce things like Roblox and Minecraft and other metaverse applications, uh, and this takes money. Um, so we're we're at the cutting edge of what kids want to do, but we need to keep ahead of the curve. Um, and also we need to develop the market. So we need to get uh, our brand out there, get our messaging out there and invest in sales development and customer acquisition. Absolutely. So what are the future plans for Genos? Are you looking to grow globally? Ultimately, yes. Australia is our launch market. You know, we're going to learn here, learn quick and then move fast. You know, ultimately, we want to make Genos the biggest possible business. And, and this is for two reasons. Number one, you know, the more kids and families and teachers that use the platform, the greater and uh, the positive impact we can make. You know, the more kids that use Genesis, you know, the more the next generation is growing up thinking about and acting on behalf of the planet. And secondly, while the missions and activities, you know, are t you know target small scale personal acts of sustainability with enough kids on it, you know, this starts to become a systemic movement. This is generational change that we're targeting. So the bigger the business, the more impact we can have. And that's really what we're targeting. Sounds fabulous. Very exciting space to be in now. That was co-founder and director of Genus, John Owen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media, so make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFT's? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. A group of investors has tabled resolutions urging four of the world's top oil and gas companies to set broad climate targets for 2030, reviving pressure on the sector after a year that saw governments shift their focus to energy security. Activist group Follow This said it had co-filed the resolutions with six major institutional investors managing $1.3 trillion in assets ahead of the annual general meetings of BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Shell next year. In the resolutions, the investors call on the companies to set targets to reduce by 2030 greenhouse gas emissions, including those from fuel sold to customers known as Scope 3 emissions, which account for the vast majority of the sector's pollution. Investors have in recent years ramped up pressure on the oil and gas sector to help tackle climate change and the follow this climate related resolutions have drawn growing support among shareholders. However, last year the efforts largely sputtered as investors turned their focus more to higher energy prices and energy security following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right now, Calcane is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. 
subscribe for the free trial now. BP, Shell and Chevron have all set some 2030 greenhouse emissions reduction targets. That includes Scope 3, though Follow This said they are not aligned with the United Nations' ambitions to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. Exxon has yet to set any 2030 Scope 3 target. The group of investors co-filing the resolutions includes Edmund D. Rothschild Asset Management, De Groof Peter Kem Asset Management, and Acmea Asset Management. Follow This did not provide the names of the other backers. Shell, BP and European peers, including Total Energies and NI, have set out strategies and targets to slash emissions to net zero by 2050 by reducing oil and gas output and growing low carbon and renewable energy businesses. In the United States, 2022 saw a wave of efforts driven by Republican politicians and right-leaning investors to focus executives' attention away from environmental, social or governance themes. Activist investor Strive Asset Management, for instance, is seeking a shareholder vote at the springtime meeting of Chevron to reverse a Scope 3 emissions reduction mandate. Exxon and Chevron have in the past successfully blocked attempts to file climate resolutions with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Cowkind Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Sunday that protecting Ukraine's borders was a constant priority and that his country was ready for all possible scenarios with Russia and its ally Belarus. In one of his nightly video addresses, Zelensky stated that protecting our border, both with Russia and Belarus, is our constant priority and that the country was preparing for all possible defence scenarios. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Zelensky made his remarks on the eve of a visit to Belarus by Russian President Vladimir Putin amid discussions of a possible new offensive by Moscow and suggestions it could originate in Belarus. In his address, Zelensky issued a new appeal to Western nations to provide Ukraine with effective air defences. He also said his forces were holding the town of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine where some of the fiercest fighting has been seen to date. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Cowkind Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. South Korea on Monday flagged a deeper economic slowdown than expected at least through the first half of next year and extended sales tax breaks on some fuel oil products and passenger cars by a few months. 
The government is expected later this week to announce its economic policy strategies for next year, which will be the first four-year statement for President Yoon suk Yeol's administration since its launch in May. South Korea's economy, the fourth largest in Asia, relies heavily on exports ranging from cars and ships to chips and smartphones. It's widely expected to see growth fall below 2% next year from close to 3% this year. The central bank last month cut its projection for next year's economic growth to 1.7% from the previous 2.1% in its scheduled revision, citing falling exports and the resultant reduction likely in corporate investment. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. As the economy now has to rely more on domestic consumption to offset the cooling export demand, the finance ministry has extended by as much as six months tax breaks on fuel oil products and passenger car sales beyond their original end 2022 expiry. The ministry is due to unveil its 2023 economic projections and strategies on Wednesday. President Yoon, struggling against low approval ratings, says exports are the best choice for the manufacturing heavy country to overcome its slump. The problem is that China, South Korea's top export market, is facing its own problems as its economy feels the impact of years of strict controls to fight COVID-19. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Molly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. In a year marked by global monetary tightening, recession concerns and a conflict in Ukraine, many stocks have performed quite well. In this video, we're going to take a look at one such stock that has gained more than 500% since the 1st of January 2022. Turkish Airlines has gained around 544% on a year-to-date basis as of the 16th of December. Turk Havayolari is a Turkey-based company which provides passenger and cargo air transportation services. It operates under the following business segments which are air transport which consists of mainly domestic and international passenger and cargo air transportation and technical maintenance services, aircraft repair and infrastructure support related to the aviation sector. In 2022, Turkish cargo continued its strong growth trend over the last decade by building on its market share gains during the pandemic. Their incorporation increased its cargo revenue by 140% during the first nine months of 2022, compared to the same period in 2019. According to the International Air Transport Association, Turkish cargo has strengthened its success by ranking fourth among air cargo carriers in August. In February of this year, Turkish cargo moved cargo operations to its highly technological new hub, Smartest. Turkish Airlines finished the third quarter of 2022 with a 1.5 billion USD net profit. The company's total revenue during the third quarter of the year was 6.1 billion USD, surpassing the same period in 2019 by 52%. Cargo revenues increased by 110% compared to the same period in 2019 and were recorded as approximately 880 million American dollars. In the first nine months of the year, their incorporation carried 54 million passengers, reaching 96% of the 2019 level. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets 
across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Additionally, in the nine months of 2022, Turkish Airlines ranked first among the European network carriers in terms of flights, according to the European Organization for the Safety of Air Navigation. The company has also decided to purchase six A350 to A900 type passenger aircraft from Airbus to be delivered this year and next. Now you can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon for video notifications. I'm Rachel for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine Media. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Lauren Ryder. She's the CEO, Leading Edge Global. When an organisation experiences rapid growth, there are many stakeholders who are affected and ensuring that all involved are prioritised is a complex task. Good change management is imperative in preventing disengaged employees and ineffective processes. So here to tell us more about the work they do is Lauren Ryder, CEO at Leading Edge Global. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Sage. I'm so glad you were free to share some of your insights with us. Let's jump straight in. Could you help us understand the mission behind Leading Edge Global and how does it feed into Leading Edge data centers? Sure. So Leading Edge Global transforms growing companies into market leaders. And we do this through our team of expert consultants who embed themselves in organizations to drive this change. And, and what we find is that there's a lot of eight figure businesses out there who are still operating like six or seven figure businesses and they have outdated systems and processes and structures. And we run these digital transformation programs to create efficiencies across their business. Now, Leading Edge Data Centers happens to be one of our clients and they are an amazing business. They are building and operating data centers across regional Australia to improve connectivity for regional Australians. So we were engaged to set up and run their customer experience and marketing function and we continue to be engaged today. Wow, that sounds amazing. Sounds like a very, very valuable client to have. So Lauren, what are the benefits of the changing work environment to hybrid these days, inviting more flexibility? You know, after two years of working at home, lots of employees are finding it difficult to return to work. They've set up their lives to be working at home. I don't think anyone's enjoying the new traffic or the long commutes. And I think do, people do really enjoy spending time with family. And businesses have proven that they can support people working at home. What I do find interesting is that there are businesses at the moment who are actually requesting that people come back to the office, stating that there's issues with culture or lower productivity. But interestingly, we've looked at some surveys and we found that that's not actually the case, that um, the businesses that are requesting people to come back full time are actually getting lower employee engagement survey results. They're finding people are burning out, there's attrition. 
and basically just the social and emotional needs are no longer being met. So I think the question really is, how can we effectively build hybrid into a long-term solution? And I do think a lot of businesses are, say, having certain days in the office, but the key is to really make use of that time, have creative solutions, run workshops, and, and really the, the areas where you need to use your brain and be in the room, do that. And I think the other thing that we really need to do is to support managers better. So managers, now that people are working from home, we need different onboarding, we need different types of training, different metrics and measurement and autonomy for managers to really cut through that red tape to help make right decisions. Because sometimes things about employees aren't really about the policies. We need to make decisions in real time. And I really think if we do that, then you know our managers will have the support they need and have better engagement with their employees. Thanks, Lauren, for sharing your insights there. I think they're trialling the four-day week in some organisations in Sydney at the moment. They were trialling it in the UK for a while, and I wonder if they will find if employees are more engaged and more productive in the four days that they come to work um, instead of the full five. That would be very interesting to see what changes could come out of that. Well, but we do have people... one client who does that, and yeah. they, they do fantastic. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, that's very, very, very interesting. Yeah, cool. The other thing from what you were saying about having accessibility to employees and you know getting them to, into the workplace is not always the best option. Um, it must be difficult to work out the balance between like a matrix style business model or a divisionalized form, getting that um, you know balance worked out. Do you think it's possible to have a balance or do you think it has to be one or the other? Oh, I think you can absolutely have a balance and, and I think you need to be flexible and it depends on what the organization is and how the organization is working. Um, it really is about communication and working together. Um, I'm working within a really large organization now who um, they are matrixed um, in some ways and in some ways you would never know who somebody actually reports to because everybody works so well together. So I think the the key to that is having really strong leadership to make it really clear on what's actually required and how people are going to work together. Great, thanks so much. Just thought I'd throw that one in the mix. So how important is it to have employees engage with and be aware of the company's business objectives for purpose-driven brands in your opinion? Yeah, well, look, a purpose-driven brand really is motivated, motivated by their core mission. So the reason they exist is to solve a problem, meet a need in society. And what's cool about it is that their purpose informs the vision, the mission, the story, their vi visual identity, how they make decisions, basically everything. And one of my favorite um, purpose-driven brands is uh, Who Gives a Crap, which is a toilet paper business, but they're a B Corp and they actually donate their profit to building toilets and providing clean water around the world. But what's really cool is how that impacts their employees. So they're actually able to get the best talent from around the world and they provide them with real benefits. They give them, say, meeting free days and a lot of flexibility to take time off. And what that's done is that's giving them a 91% on their culture survey, which is a very, very high result. So what we find is that employees of purpose-driven businesses are actually innately aware of their business objectives because they're woven through everything they do. So I think the question is, how can we get those same results for non-purpose-driven brands, you know, just everyday companies? And I think that the answer really is to embed those vision, mission, and values across everything they do. And that's even the first thing, when we embark on a digital transformation, we come in and we make sure they have a really strong vision, mission and values. And I think you'll get the same results that way. Lauren, that was such a great example. I mean, the markets are, the, the financial markets, they're affected by sentiment and emotion, yet a lot of those businesses can be quite cold places to work where you are expected to come out res with results, and if you don't, there are consequences. And it's just, you know, it seems logical that en emotion is energy in motion and you'd want to find the two work together. So what you gave us an example there was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. As we move on, what are the biggest barriers for businesses looking to transform digitally? How can change be managed without causing bottlenecks and workflow in your opinion? 
Yeah, so look, if we look at transformation holistically, looking at a, uh, an, a overhauling a business model, there's sort of three key areas we look at. So we look at the people, the process, and the technology. So one would think in a digital transformation, the technology would be the hard bit, but it's actually the easiest bit. If we have the requirements right, we know what we're building, the technology is fine. Where we struggle during a transformation is in the process and the people. So with the processes, the key is to map the future state as accurately as we can. The challenge is so many businesses haven't even mapped their current state. So in order to get their future state, the best way to do that um, is to get everyone who is impacted into a room to do design those future state workshops. And an even bigger step is what we try and do is break that model. So we actually run examples all the way through. So for the processes, that's where we really find some bottlenecks, but that's how we solve them. The challenge really actually comes in with the people. And the fact is nobody likes change. And it's all really in our brains because our brains think that change is danger. Um, and they'll take the path of least resistance, which is basically not adopting the change. And if we don't adopt the solution, the transformation will fail. So some really important tips to get through a transformation with the least impact to business is first of all having that strong sponsor, somebody who lives and breathes and embeds that change through everything they do all the way to the end. Um, the second thing I recommend is rolling out what we call leader-led change, which is by having all of the leaders in the organization roll the change out to their people. Um, a lot of times they don't have the skills to do that, and that's where we come in. We train them on how to lead change, and we mentor and coach them. And the final thing that we do to make a transformation effective is to co-create the solution. So bring as many people on board to actually um, design what the future state is going to look like and also have ongoing feedback to make sure that we always know exactly how we're doing. So those are tips for transformation success. Wow, thanks so much. Really like your style there. And I don't think people should be afraid to take a good, long, hard look at themselves and see what they can do better, but it's not always easy. You're so right. So as we wind up, it's been tumultuous times, inflation, the cost of living's rising, and in some cases, wages are matching up, but not always. Do you have any advice for those wanting to negotiate a pay rise with their bosses during these high inflationary times? Absolutely. Look, you're right. The cost of living is rising. So it's no wonder employees are wanting pay rise now. Um, inflation sitting what, around 6.1%, which actually has some serious impacts to people's lives and especially taking into account the interest, um, the increase in mortgage rates. So, you know, there's quite a few thousand dollars over the course of a year that people are impacted. So I think, you know, the first question we need to ask is, is it a good time to ask for a pay rise? And I'd say, look, absolutely. I think it's probably always a good time to ask, but do keep in mind that businesses are actually feeling the same pressures that we are. So what you have to do is be ready to have a negotiation and to handle the situation maturely and calmly. So the idea is to come prepared and come into the discussion really asking the right way. Um, I think the second question really is, how much should we ask for? Now, you might be tempted to ask for the full 6.1%, but I think we really need to keep the big picture in mind. There actually has been about a 2.5% pay rise over the last two years. So just ask yourself, have you actually gotten a pay rise? Did you manage to keep your job during the pandemic? You know, if your business has already looked after you, factor that in. So. I think um, a lot of people prepare for a pay rise conversation based on merit and achievements. But this year, in the current environment, it might actually just be a number for your business. So if you're looking at an actual number, I suggest going in for about the 4 to 5% increase mark. Look, don't take it personally. Talk about the inflation. Let them know how much you're out of pocket. And if you don't get it, don't take it personally. It's tough times for everyone out there. Great advice. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren. I really enjoyed our chat. Thanks so much, Sage. And if you've just joined us, we had an informative discussion with Lauren Ryder, the CEO at Leading Edge Global. To watch the full interview, please head to Calkine Media's YouTube channel and keep watching Calkine Media for more live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media.
The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kelkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Thanks for joining us on Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is on the list for the Forbes 30 Under 30 VCs, and Mahesh Velenki is his name, managing partner of Superlayer. Web3 is the new era of the internet that's set to empower users. $4 billion was invested in blockchain gaming in 2021, with $7 billion already reached for 2022. Superlayer, a Web3 venture studio, has dozens of new social token projects built on the RLY network. So here to tell us more about Engage to Earn, Play to Earn, and how social-powered blockchain could onboard millions of users to Web3 is Mahesh Velanki, managing partner of Superlayer. Welcome to the show, Mahesh. Hey, Sage. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Thank you, and congratulations on your recent $25 million funding from Polygon. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. So they're joining the ranks of an already star-studded suite of investors, including Gary V, Mark Andreessen, and even Paris Hilton. So you're definitely mixing in the right circles. It's a fun, it's a fun group, and we're excited to have all these folks involved. Wow. So can we start with um, asking you a little bit about Superlayer's focus in Web3? Will it be blockchain play-to-earn games mainly? So it's actually going to be a mix of things. I can start a little bit with what Superlayer does. So really what Superlayer is, it's a venture studio co-founding premium Web3 projects. Uh, but what, what do I mean by premium? And, and what I mean by that is what we're really bringing together like a unique depth of experience, uh, co-founding previously successful crypto projects, in addition to a team of specialists that we've brought on, uh, together across, you know, to focus on blockchain tech, zero to one startup methodology, token economics, go to market, partnerships, compliance, and a whole bunch more. And so we pull all this together into the studio that we call Superlayer, and we, we try to, you know, we're trying to build the next blue chip um, consumer internet web three projects. And so games is certainly one of the more interesting categories always, you know, within the consumer internet sphere broadly. And so blockchain gaming is definitely a, you know, core to some of the incubations that we, we have. Um, and I could talk a little bit more about that. But yes, we're very excited about the future of Web3 games. 
um, and Superlayer is, is excited to invest and build um, in this area. Thanks, Mahesh, for sounding that out for us. I mean, there's a lot of innovation going on in the territory you're working in, so it's exciting to see what's going to happen. And according to DAP Radar, 748 million was raised by Metaverse and Web3 companies since August. That's a 135% increase from the previous month alone. So even in like the depth of the bear market, there seems to be a lot of interest in your space. What's the Metaverse, basically, and how does gaming fit in it? And how will it differ from gaming today? It's a great question, and I get that question a lot about what is the metaverse um, and what does it even mean, right? And I think I think there's different viewpoints on this. Uh, for me, I think there's a spectrum out there. There's folks who view the metaverse as this kind of sci-fi, Ready Player One-esque, uh, immersive, augmented reality or virtual reality type experience. And while I think that you know is will, will happen in the future, you know, at some point, I think. Um, there's another camp that views that as a little bit of a market metaverse is a little bit of a marketing term and that we're already in the metaverse, you know, just based on the time we spend online increasingly in apps uh, as opposed to in real life. And so while these two camps may converge at some point, um, you know, and you do have big companies like Facebook pushing what's possible with VR, with new hardware experiences like social spaces, um, other big tech companies are heading towards AR. Uh, but if you look at the metaverse as a function of time spent online, then a game like Fortnite today, um, you know, which is consuming a huge amount of your, you know, of people's time, could indicate that we're already in the metaverse. And so, gaming fits in because it's always been one of the, you know, internet categories that's driven the most, uh, you know, engagement and eyeballs, and will continue to do so as technology progresses. And I think crypto in particular is exciting and blockchain gaming because. It's really just about making um, these digital economies more real, like more real economies with real assets, um, so that the digital world becomes even more important for you know a set of people um, relative to the physical world. Absolutely. I mean, I really enjoy reporting on the subject, being some sort of a bridge between the lay people who are seeing all these changes happening, and with the developers like yourself who are making these changes you know, actually happen. And what you're saying there about the games and social media already existing in the metaverse, it's so true. And I love the fact that our digital identities could possibly add value on chain and, you know, what we create is going to make sense and become real value one day. I agree. I agree. And I, I agree. And I think people already spend so much time online and in these games. And so it's only natural that we find ways for people to um, play the game for fun if they want to play for fun, if they want to uh, make money playing the game or, or uh, do a certain task in the game that happens to be a little bit more like work, you know, that gets them paid. Um, in, a, in essence, if they want to treat the game more like a real world economy where they can do whatever they want, whether that's buy entertainment or provide a valuable good service, um, you know, technology should enable that and let people do what they want to do and I think that you know I think what that means is there will be a lot of new alternative career paths um, you know in the future um, and, and jobs in the digital world that just don't exist today. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm, I'm launching a live stream show on a Web3 platform, and it's kind of weird to think that a dating app um, was started by Bored Apes, Yacht Club, but NFT dating app, but that didn't do so well. But who knows, maybe our decentralized identifiers could help with the algorithms that work on dating apps. So moving on to a quote from Eric Guan, one of your uh, co-workers, the head of economy and design at Superlayer. He was quoted saying, it takes a village to raise a Web3 project. Um, a great quote. Could you tell us a little bit more about the workflow that founders go through um, to get the investors and developers and the community advocates to make a successful project? Yeah, it's, it's a great quote, and I think what he meant by that is that, like, basically, building a web, any startup is hard, right? Um, and it's even harder when you're operating at the bleeding edge of technology, whether that's AI or self-driving cars or you know whatever, whatever it is, and cert certainly crypto. And so when you think about like crypt building crypto, you really need to bring together a really complex set of things to market, um, which include things like, like technology choices, which blockchain ecosystem are you building on, which protocols and tools are you using, what's the actual product that you're designing, which is already hard enough, you know, for most startups, like 
who, what are you building and for whom, like what problem are you, are you trying to solve or net new experience are you trying to create? Um, and then there's a little economic design. Like now we've got fungible tokens, NFTs, on-chain transactions, like how do these interface with the particular product that you're building, you know, to add a little bit more complexity. And then if there, if there is a concept of like, you know, a, a liquid token, um, how do you, what's your strategy around token liquidity, which, who are you partnering with in terms of like market makers or exchanges or protocols? Like there's just a lot to figure out when you're minting essentially a money supply, a liquid money supply. Um, and, you know, go to market, community, you know, and then all of this, um, for all this to be possible, companies have to figure out the GNA, like the general administrative um, functions, such as legal, finance, tax, right? Like regulatory, how do you, um, what is your strategy around around all these things, whether you're a centralized entity or a permissionless decentralized protocol, um, all setting up this up determines, you know, how you think about the back office of your company as well. So it's just a lot of different things that requires a lot of a lot of different expertise. And there's no playbooks for any of this. There will be one day. There's no playbooks for any of this yet. It's all being figured out. And so that's where, you know, to, to plug super layer a little bit, that, that's what we're trying to solve for, right? We're trying to bring as much expertise as possible that's available in the market right now to give us the best shot at creating what we believe are like the next blue chip projects. Space. Yeah, right. And you've got some brilliant experience already from Groupon um, and some other social um, areas as well, I, I believe. Um, so how do games companies typically approach marketing and how will this be similar or different with blockchain based games, please? Yeah, no, it's, the, the games industry has historically, um, on the marketing front, has been historically very sad. Like, you know, games has always, you know, has, has always been a big business um, it's bigger than most people realize it's actually you know, bigger than the you know, movie industry I can't remember the exact statistics um, but if you're if you're building a triple-a blockbuster game those are typically marketed like a big budget movie you know there's a multi-channel approach with commercials and trailers and tons of physical and digital advertising leading up to a launch um, and if you know in the past decade with free-to-play games on mobile, um, their focus has been almost entirely on acquiring users cost effectively through mobile advertising and figuring out how to monetize these users um, to generate a good ROI on, on marketing spend. And so free to play gaming makes a majority of the market today. Um, but even that's gotten much harder over time due, due to the changing app store rules and increased competition and increased cost to acquire the users. And so um, I think in, in Web3 gaming, um, there's a lot of you know a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of excitement to find uh, with, you know tools and, and uh, technologies that can uh, be used to make better games, right? And I think the industry is still figuring out uh, a lot of the things on the marketing front, like who are these users with these wallets? Like what are they worth from a revenue or you know LTV perspective? How do you segment these users and run campaigns to find more of them? And on which channels, right? And, the reality is almost none of this is this Web3 marketing infrastructure has been figured out yet. Um, it's not in place yet. And so it'll just take some time. But once we figure this out uh, and we can calculate what a user is worth, blockchain games will then be able to effectively acquire users. And um, you'll probably see a huge wave of venture capital coming into the space at that time and um, fueling the growth of many different types of blockchain game projects. So that's, that's a little bit of kind of my view on marketing and games and where we've been and where we're uh, where we're headed thank you Mahesh that's so interesting because I think um, a lot of that data has not really been readily available about who's using the wallet's a great point that you raised there so what do big companies like Superlayer look for in employees how do game designers devs and other tech professionals get hired by a great company like yours sure and yeah Superlayer is I wouldn't say we're a big company but we're certainly uh, you know, we've got a great team, of about 20, 20, uh, 20 folks. Um, but yeah, I think you know any project in Web three, big or small. You know, the first thing I look for is uh, that I recommend is, is looking for somebody with any existing Web three experience at relevant projects. And this is, of course, very hard to find as a small, you know, it's a small group of people right now. But um, you know, if, if you can find somebody with relevant uh, experience uh, in crypto, uh, that's fantastic. If the candidate has no 
went through experience. It's just looking for somebody who has a really strong curiosity and personal passion, um, and ideally an active user or participant in many different crypto communities already. Uh, I think that is that's the next best thing. Um, and then, you know, I think it's just the industry is crypto just moves even faster than the regular technology industry, and so it's just important to like be able to learn incredibly quickly by looking around at the market, just understanding what other projects are doing and what makes them interesting and where, where things are headed. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, everything we look for is role specific. You know, can they do the the job and do they have the skills required for the you know, particular role that they're, that they're interviewing for? Thank you so much for your insights, Mahesh. I suppose the open nature of blockchain projects allows for a lot of creativity and innovation. So I guess that's what you'll be looking for as well, people who know where to source that info and, and do what they know how to do with it. Absolutely. It's a wild, wild west you know, out there sometimes. And so uh, finding folks who are really scrappy and can just figure things out is always a plus. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I found that so valuable. Really appreciate you joining Expert Talks today. Pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Take care. So if you just joined us, we had a very interesting, informative discussion with Mahesh Valenki. He's the managing partner of Superlayer. If you missed any part of that or want to watch it again, it will be available on Calkai Media's YouTube channel. Keep watching for more live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkai.
Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to the ASX at Breakfast, exclusive to Calkine TV, where we provide you with all the information you need for a successful day of trading. The Australian share market looks set to end the week with a solid gain following a decent night on Wall Street. According to the latest SPI futures, the ASX 200 is expected to open 33 points or 0.45% higher this morning. Additionally, Thursday was a very strong day for the ASX. The S&P ASX 200 closed up Thursday, gaining 85.1 points or 1.18% to 7,280.4 and in the process set a new 20-day high. The top performing stocks in this index were Pilbara Minerals and Liontown Resources up 4.52% and 4.33% respectively. Over the last five days, the index has gained 3.07%, but is down 2.13% for the last 52 weeks. Let's now take a look at some price-sensitive announcements coming out of the ASX this morning. And Aerometrics, a geospatial tech company with a focus on providing data-driven insights for a range of business applications, has today announced that it has been awarded a significant contract of work with an Australian federal government agency. The value of the purchase order is $1.88 million and comprises of a number of areas of interest. The revenue will be recognised on the delivery of data for each capture area to the client and delivery of all data is expected to be completed by the 30th of June 2023. And also making news today is Galena Mining. Galena has announced that the first concentrate was produced at its Abra Base Metals Mine yesterday, January 12, as part of the plant commissioning process. Managing Director Tony James commented that the commissioning of the processing plant is progressing quickly and concentrate production shows initial process flow continuity. Ganela will continue with the commissioning through January with the focus on achieving the plant's processing design criteria and working towards first product shipment in quarter one of the CY 2023. Alright, time now for a quick break on the ASX at breakfast before we take a look at world markets, the Aussie dollar, oil, gold and the world of crypto. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Welcome back to the ASX of Breakfast on Calcine TV, where we provide you with all the information you'll need for a successful day of trading. Taking a look at global markets and on Wall Street, the Dow Jones rose by 0.64%, the S&P 500 increased 0.34%, and the Nasdaq jumped up by 0.64%. This was driven by the softening of inflation in the United States. In Europe, it was also a sea of green. London's FTSE 100 rose by 0.89%, the German DAX increased 0.74%, as did the French CAC, rising by 0.74%, and the Stock 600 index closed up by 0.63%. The Aussie dollar has remained stable over the past 24 hours. One Aussie dollar is currently buying 69.69 US cents. Moving on, and oil prices rose over the past 24 hours. WTI crude grew by 1.27%, or 98 US cents, to trade at 78 US dollars and 39 cents a barrel. Whilst Brent crude also saw an increase of $1.09 or 1.32% to trade at $83 US dollars and 76 cents a barrel. Key precious metals all enjoyed strong performances in the past 24 hours. Gold is trading 1.12% higher at $1,899.9 an ounce. Silver is trading at 1.91% higher at $23 US dollars and 93 cents an ounce whilst copper is up by 0.16% at 417 US dollars and 25 cents an ounce, and iron ore futures are pointing to a rise of 0.93%. And lastly, the crypto market has experienced a strong day. In the past 24 hours, the global crypto market cap has increased 4.78% to be valued at approximately 904.72 billion US dollars. Bitcoin has gained a whopping 7.34% in the past 24 hours, to trade at just above 18,869 US dollars as of 9:45 a.m. Sydney time according to Coin Market Cap. Well that's all for this edition of the ASX at Breakfast. Have a great day trading and make sure to keep it locked here on Calkine TV for the latest market insights and business news. 
I'm James Preston, signing off for now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calcine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calcine Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calcai Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on Australia and a buy now, pay later company called PayRight. Now, PayRight makes things more affordable for customers by spreading the cost of purchases over time. Today, I have with me Miles Redwood. He's the co-founder and joint CEO of PayRight. Thanks for joining me today, Miles. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, firstly, Miles, could you tell us a little more about PayRight? How would you describe its business model and what are the key solutions PayRight provides? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the description you gave is, is pretty close to the mark. You know, we're, we're a, a point of sale consumer lender, which effectively means we give our customers the ability to walk into one of our rapidly growing uh, merchants across both Australia and New Zealand and, and make a purchase today. And, and pay for that purchase over, over time. So it's deferred payment options uh, offered at the point of sale. I'm sure uh, everyone listening in today is, is, is increasingly familiar with, with buy now, pay later as a, as a category and as a, a concept. Obviously we've seen well, an explosion really in demand for uh, pay over time point of sale services in recent years, but we're very much the first to come to market that specialise in transactions over $1,000. So that's our key point of difference. And what that also means is we have a very distinctly different merchant mix. I think most people know and understand buy now, pay later in the concept or in the context, I should say, of retail and retail is an important and rapidly growing vertical for us. But again, being 
quite considerably higher price point, a very distinctly different offering. Uh, we have merchants outside of that sector in areas like home improvement, photography, uh, education, uh, health and beauty and, and aftermarket automotive as well. Excellent. And how do you see the buy now pay later sector developing over the future? Oh, I, I see there's still a lot of growth left in the sector. Um, you know, it's still, d despite being a fairly progressive and developed and very much established uh, sector now, it's still very much in its infancy. And we're seeing that with the growth that not just we're continuing to deliver as a business, but all the, the players, particularly, well, in, not only in the micro ticket end of the market, but in this middle ticket end of the market, which is where we, we specialise as well, which again is very much a lot less congested. And I think certainly from the, uh, the end of that market, that middle ticket end of the market, as, I'm descri as I've described it there, with that very distinctly different offering and that very diversified merchant mix, I think there is significant growth still to come. Uh, both here in Australia and, of course, in New Zealand as well. Absolutely. And looking at your financials, during the fourth quarter of financial year 2022, you reached $100 million in gross receivables. How did you achieve this? Yeah, we did. And look, that was obviously a pretty significant milestone for us to hit that $100 million, you know, $100 million mark. That was up 46% uh, compared to, to where we were in, in, in the prior year period. And a lot of that really is off the back of uh, the really good, strong growth and obviously demand we've seen uh, uh, within the loan book across those those uh, quite distinctly different diversified merchant uh, verticals that I described earlier. A lot of the growth throughout the financial year uh, and the calendar year, and we're still seeing that growth into the current current financial year, the current quarter has come from areas like home improvement. Obviously, travel's been a little bit restricted, albeit starting to open up again certainly over the past six months. But prior to that, a lot of the growth we saw was through that home improvement vertical areas like solar, um, flooring, fencing, roofing, decking, trade services as well. So, so plumbing and electrical. Uh, in recent quarters, we've seen uh, sectors and areas like health and beauty and photography really open up again. So a lot of that growth has come come through those verticals, and again off to a flying start now that we're, we're approaching midway through uh, the first quarter of, of 2022 or FY22, I should say. Absolutely. And um, as I know, PayRight is accepted in 3,899 stores. That's a staggering 77,000 customers that you saw in the fourth quarter of 2022. So how do you plan to further expand your merchant and customer base? Yeah, that, that's right. You know, and obviously both those numbers in terms of the merchant count and also the customer count significantly further progress now that again we're you know, um, uh, well beyond 30 30 June, so fast approaching the 100,000 customer mark, uh, and rapidly approaching sort of 4,000 and beyond in terms of those those merchants, both both here in Australia and like I say across in New Zealand as well. And a lot of that continued growth, the ongoing growth, we expect to continue to come uh, through those merchant verticals that I described earlier. Um, we're seeing a lot of inbound queries and contacts uh, for merchants that might have a solution in place in the micro ticket end of the market. It's called that sub $1,000 end of the market. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with, with groups like uh, like Afterpay and others, but typically they cap out at around $1,000. So what we're finding is uh, merchants are screaming out for a solution north of $1,000. So rather than competing with the Afterpays of this world, uh, our product sits well alongside uh, and indeed complements a merchant's uh, um, um, offering that may already have one of the micro ticket BMPL providers already embedded. So that's where we expect to see that growth well and truly continue and in fact accelerate certainly into the current financial year and beyond. And just finally, Miles, where do you see the company in the mid to longer term? Yeah, look, like, like I say, we've plenty of growth to, to, to come here. Um, you know, we, we expect to continue to penetrate further into into our existing verticals, and we expect to continue to get good organic growth. Um, there are a number of other products that we're looking to deploy uh, into the market, which we expect to complement our existing um, product and our, and our product offering. Sort of a bit of a watch this space. I won't reveal too much now, but certainly, uh, you know, do keep your eyes on on payroll as a stock because we're, you know, certainly very much in that growth phase, but also very much focus on that path to profitability, and uh, that's a significant focus area for us. We do expect to get there within the next 18 months, um, and from there, it's just continue to grow and scale beyond that. Fantastic! It sounds like a real growth area. Thanks for your time today, Miles. Terrific. Thank you.
Thank you. And that was Miles Redwood, co-founder and joint CEO of Paywright. Now, if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalki Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel Jones, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking, and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar, and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage from Calcai Media. Italy's Vega rockets have been grounded and an investigation is underway after the latest model failed on its second mission, destroying two Earth imaging satellites and further complicating Europe's access to space on top of the war in Ukraine. Launch firm Ariane Space said on Wednesday a serious anomaly occurred two minutes and 27 seconds after the upgraded Vega C left the pad in French Guiana twatting efforts to add two satellites to the Pleiades Neo constellation operated by Airbus. Unfortunately, we can say that the mission is lost and I want to deeply apologize, Ariane Space Chief Executive Stefani Israel told a video feed of the launch, monitored via space.com. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. A spokesperson for Ariane Space said both the Vega C and its Vega predecessor had been grounded pending the findings of an investigative commission co-chaired by technical officials from the European Space Agency and Ariane Space itself. Israel told reporters the Commission would consult independent experts and propose robust and long-lasting corrective actions to guarantee a safe and reliable return to flight. Italy's Vega C rocket is due to play an increasingly crucial role in Europe's access to space after Moscow's invasion of Ukraine forced Ariane Space to stop using Russian Soyuz vehicles. Until now, Europe has relied on the Vega program for small payloads, Soyuz for medium ones and Ariane for heavy missions. Italian industry minister Adolfo Urso expressed full confidence that the launches will resume soon without saying why he was optimistic. But Ariane Space has been forced to scrap plans to announce a Vega C launch schedule for 2023 in the coming weeks. Thanks so much for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. HSBC on Wednesday defeated a £116 million, or £141 million US dollar lawsuit in a London court over allegations the bank should have refused to make payments for convicted financier 
Alan Stanford. The liquidators of Stanford International Bank argued HSBC missed warning signs that the Antigua-based lender was a fraud before it ultimately collapsed in February of 2009. In 2012, Stanford was sentenced to 110 years in prison in the United States for running a $7 billion Ponzi scheme, affecting approximately 18,000 former investors. Prosecutors said Stanford sold fraudulent high-yielding certificates of deposits through Stanford International Bank and used investor money to make risky investments and fund a lavish lifestyle in the Caribbean. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The liquidators brought a civil case in London to recover £116 million, which was paid out of Stanford International Bank's accounts with HSBC, before being paid to Stanford International Bank's customers in redemption payments and interest. Their lawsuit was thrown out by the Court of Appeal last year and on Wednesday, the United Kingdom's Supreme Court dismissed the liquidator's appeal by a four to one majority. Announcing the court's decision, Judge Vivian Rose said the payments do not amount to a recoverable loss because the payments made relieved Stanford International Bank of £116 million worth of its contractual liabilities. That the bank's assets would have been the same if the payments were not made because it would have £116 million more in cash, but it would have owed £116 million more in debt. Thanks for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Cyber Mutual insurer Miris has received an operating license from Belgian regulators and will start offering insurance from January 1st. It said on Wednesday as it looks to capitalise on increasing demand for cyber cover due to rising attacks. The new insurer has signed up 12 European corporate clients and is talking to some 40 others about joining. Chief Operating Officer Mark Pollard said by phone. Belgian chemicals group Solvay is one of the insurer's founding members, a Solvay spokesperson said by email. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Miris will provide additional cover for companies whose cyber insurance options are scarce and expensive due to mounting losses, Pollard said. The amount of capacity big insurers are offering has been reducing. Premiums are increasing. It's like turning a tap off. Global cyber attacks increased by 28% in the third quarter compared with the same period in 2021, according to software firm Checkpoint. Pollard declined to confirm trade press reports that Miris's other initial members include Airbus, BASF and Michelin. The companies did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Thanks for watching. Please do like, share, comment, keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, 
then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Germany's finance ministry expects activity in Europe's biggest economy to remain subdued during the fourth quarter of this year and first quarter of next and sees declining inflation rates during 2023, according to its monthly report. The report stated that overall economic developments are expected to remain subdued in the winter half year. The report continued to state, however, that relatively stable labour market developments and the government's relief measures are providing supportive impetus. It also added that current estimates pointed to declining inflation rates, albeit at a raised level next year. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Tax revenues rose 2% in November from the same month last year to 55.95 billion euros. In the first 11 months of the year, the tax take increased by 8.7%. In an interview in the report, Finance Minister Christian Linder said his response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine had led to higher debt levels than he would have liked. This, however, was unavoidable as a special response to challenges such as soaring energy prices were required. Since Linda took over the finance ministry a year ago, debt has risen to about 500 billion euros, including a 200 billion euro protective shield against high energy prices and 100 billion euros to modernise the armed forces. However, the minister said he aimed to return to a sustainable, stable financial policy in the long term. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Kalkine Media's crypto buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkine Media. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine Media, I'm Sage. Today's special guest is Pamela Komonos. She's the founder and CEO of Komonos Family Lawyers. Now for some background, family law is an incredibly significant sector of the law covering housing land titles, alimony and child support payments as well as the severance of joint contracts and custody issues. It's especially important as it deals not only with the articles and 10 A's of legislature, but also with people's relationships, futures and lives. Especially when there are children involved, it's important to handle family law matters in a professional and thoughtful manner. Here to share her insights about working in this space is Pamela Komonos. Welcome to the show, Pamela. Thank you so much, Sage. How are you? Oh, I'm well, thank you. And I can't wait to get started because I don't think you can ever be too prepared for this type of life event. And it is a life event. I don't think it's um, 
you know, it's up there with marriage. It's up, you know, divorce is one of the hardest things that people can come up against in life. Mm. Um, so if you don't mind, can we begin with what your main objectives are for running your business, the law firm? Okay, so the, the business has been around for the last 12 years or so, and the main objective has always been client care. So it's very much very, it's very focused on clients. And we understand that when our clients come to us, it is one of the most vulnerable times in their lives. Divorce, as you've indicated, is a life changing event. So we take that very seriously. So when our clients come to us, it's very much a very, a very empathetic approach, a very supportive approach and a very reassuring one. Often they're navigating the law for the very, very first time and it's off, it's in an unhappy event for them. So we're, we take a very client-focused approach, if you like. Thank you, Pamela. So how important for you as the business owner and being a female business owner in this space, mm -hmm. how important is it for you to align your brand image to the inner workings and mechanics of your corporate strategy, please? So our, our brand image and, and inner corporate strategy, strategy is very much aligned. I can't see the two not being aligned. Brand The brand image is all about, as I said, a caring, empathetic, do no harm philosophy. And again, everything we do in-house, we, we work towards meeting those goals. So the, the, the practice is very, has a very clear vision and, and the clear vision is that we see it, we envision, envision a world where people separate with care, respect and dignity. And everything we do within the practice is all about minimising harm, always thinking about the best interests of children particularly, and looking at solutions that avoid people having to go into more conflict, which is often the case when you need to go to litigation, for example. So we're always looking for all solutions that assist our clients to resolve their matters as amicably and quickly as they possibly can. Thank you. Now, just aside from our main discussion, if I can just ask this, just because you've inspired me with your answer, you, mm. um, you mentioned that you want to, you know, come to mediation as amicably as possible. Do you ever find that people might prefer to represent themselves and maybe even try to outwit the lawyers in, in this case? <laughs> <laughs> People don't naturally want to represent themselves. It's not it's not a thing that they want to want to do necessarily. Often they're limited because there's cost issues that are involved, or it's quite protracted litigation. Uh, my personal experience and my professional experience, if you representing yourself is quite it has a lot of um, danger. The word danger is quite strong, but it has a lot of pitfalls. And it's like me. I'm not an expert say, for example, in dentistry, so I wouldn't ever dare to start doing any kind of cavity work in my mouth. So in, in very similar ways, it's the law is very technical. It's for people who really understand and there's a lot of experience in that. So representing yourself often may seem like an attractive way of saving money and costs, etc. But in the long run, it actually can be quite quite hurtful and quite harmful and have other opportunity costs that you may not be able to see initially. Very true. So Thank I hope you that answered this. your question in a long-winded oh. way. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. You. So you. moving on now, how important is community building and having a digital presence like mm. for your business mm. to be successful? Mm. Very good question. Traditionally, lawyers don't have much of an affinity with the social media world or not much connection with with i suppose having a digital presence but i've always been a little bit different i think it's very important to speak openly about what you stand for and have a visible presence in the community and that's been my absolute focus along with of course the running the business and the care of our clients and the care of our team as well in-house but it has very much been about being in the public eye and building mutually respectful relationships as I work in this, in this very, very challenging industry. 
Yes, I think there's been a lot more pressure on businesses to offer some form of transparency or to talk about their processes and what they're hoping to achieve uh, mm -hmm. instead of just setting goals and not really stating why they're setting those goals or how they're setting out to achieve those goals. So it's really interesting to see this new age where everyone's getting 15 minutes of corporate fame in these type of interviews and things like that. And thank you for agreeing to share your insights today. Um, we don't talk to many lawyers, so... Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm try I want to break, I guess in some ways it'd be great to break that mold because lawyers are human and they can be very creative and they can have lots of ideas and yeah, we're not, there's a stereotype of lawyers, I guess, in some ways that they're pretty reg regimented and rigid. That's not necessarily the case. That's great to know. I like mm -hmm. to see that people with such high status levels as lawyers also as approachable because sometimes it can be quite intimidating to try and express your feelings to people who have such you know, high IQs and who know so much. So, Well, thanks for th saying that. It's very kind. There are a lot of people <laughs> in the world who've got very high IQs. Um, the profession, it, we, the way I've been practicing for many, many years is really about being accessible and it's really just being ordinary and just being one of the clients in many, many ways because the philosophy that I have is I put myself in the client's shoes and I often say, well, if I wanted to be represented or if I needed a lawyer, what sort of lawyer would I want? And that's the first question that I always think before I sit down and have a conversation with a client. So it's great. very, very client-centric, yeah. Yes, great ethos to have. So what is the most important thing to keep in mind when regarding, uh, sorry, when talking about houses and finances, especially um, when going through a divorce? Another very good question, Sage, thank you. For me, divorce connotes or conjures up a lot of emotion for people, yeah? So there's a lot of pain and a lot of emotion and maybe there's, there's some level of uh, upset, distress, maybe even some level of vindictiveness and not being able to let go. And I know that's another very harsh word. But I think if you really want to be clever about it, you, want to, you, you need to start thinking from the perspective of, of it being a commercial decision. So we look at everything from even though we're, we understand that people are going through a life-changing transition and an event, we take the approach of being commercially minded at all times. So we we look at things from the perspective of rational rather than emotional. And again, you know, maybe that's that's what people are paying me for essentially, not to be that emotional person, but rather to be rational, calm and considered and give them the best commercial outcomes possible. So that's that's the philosophy that we that we adopt and approach. And it, it, again, it's it's not a win, it's not a loser or winner kind of situation, to be honest. It's here you are, it's difficult, there are losses. How do we make the most of what we have right now? You're exactly right. I mean, when people are feeling emotional and the tensions are rising, don't always make the best decisions for yourself or maybe decisions you may regret in the future. So no, I, I agree, think... I agree. Yeah, you, yeah. And, and that's what I, I see myself as a trusted advisor, someone who people come to to trust that I have the knowledge and the experience to navigate and support them through this very difficult time, but also not, I don't, I try and keep a distance because that's my role is to be, be quite clear and reassuring, but also I don't want to use the word unemotional because that, that makes me sound like I'm unempathetic and I'm not unempathetic. Mm. However, not to allow the emotions to take over the commercial reality of the situation. That must be such high level skills you have there to be able to blend in being empathetic as well as keeping abreast of the lateral decision making process on what's best mm. for both parties. Mm. Amazing. Um, do you have any insights on how you can prepare yourself for these type of discussions just before we wind up the discussion? In terms of discussions going through a separation, telling spouses, what's the, what's the I'm, not, I'm unclear a little bit of the question. Um, how you prepare yourself for mediation with couples. Okay, so I'm a lawyer and my role is to represent an individual so I wouldn't represent a couple at mediation. 
Right. All right. So essentially what we do is that we, we, we have a philosophy again of do no harm, but also setting up our client for success. So we spend a good few hours with the client way prior to the any mediation. And we look at all the ways that we can have a win-win solution. And win-win doesn't always mean that we walk away with everything we have. Often it could mean that we make concessions. Okay, so we have a we have a reality check, I guess, with our clients to prepare them so they can really understand what's involved in this process. Great, thanks so much. So, what can we expect from Commonwealth Family Lawyers? What's in the pipeline? A lot, actually. It's a pretty dynamic business that I'm running, and I'm really excited about it. For me, from from our perspective, is continuing doing the good work for our clients. Of course, is continuing building a really healthy and harmonious, harmonious and cohesive culture, and that's something that's really, really important to me. We see our our family, we see our team as a family. Just we've got a very much a family flavour to it, if you like. The other thing that our business is looking to do is bring change our pricing because. One of the things that we've been talking about is that this hourly rate is, can be a real problem for clients, especially when they're uncertain about costs. So we're looking at providing fixed fee services. And finally, what we're looking to do is provide additional services on either end. So if you're in that situation where you're not sure whether you should stay or leave a relationship, we're looking at providing some service, services to support you. And then following the divorce journey when it's all done and dusted, how do we rebuild our lives? So they're the two, they're the kind of, they're the things that we're looking at at CFL. Wow, sounds amazing. Best of luck with that. And thank, thank you. you so much really for joining us today. It. Yeah, we really do appreciate your insights. So okay. if you just, you. yeah, have a great day. All right. Now, if you just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Pamela Komonos. She's the CEO and founder of Komonos Family Lawyers. Please watch the full interview via Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. And this is Sage reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFT's? Well do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. An airline company must end up with the majority stake in ITA Airways after the privatisation process of the state-owned carrier is concluded, an Italian government decree seen by Reuters said. In the meantime, the Treasury should have a say on the new shareholders, the decree stipulated. Right now, Calcane is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Sources had previously told Reuters the decree passed on Wednesday was aimed at facilitating the full privatisation of ITA, which was created last year from the ashes of the failed Alitalia starting with the sale of an initial minority stake. And Germany's Lufthansa is the front runner to buy into ITA, sources have said. Thanks so much for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcon Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcon Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.
Chip maker Micron Technology Incorporated on Wednesday, December 21, forecast a much steeper than expected second quarter loss and said that it will lay off around 10% of its workforce next year, citing a nagging glut in the semiconductor market. Micron Chief Executive Sanjay Marotra said that due to the significant supply and demand mismatch entering calendar year 2023, the company expects that profitability will remain challenged throughout 2023. Micron had about 48,000 employees worldwide as of the 1st of September. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Micron reporting earnings on Wednesday forecast second quarter revenue of 3.8 billion US dollars, plus or minus 200 million dollars above Wall Street estimates. But it forecasts a loss of 62 cents per share, plus or minus 10 cents, much steeper than analyst estimates for a 30 cent loss. Micron shares fell over 1% in extended trading. They've also fallen by about 45% so far this year. Red hot inflation, rising interest rates, Geopolitical tensions and COVID-19 lockdowns in China have led businesses and consumers to rein in expenses, hitting the PC and smartphone market and in turn, the business of chip makers. The situation was a quick U-turn from chip shortages last year that hit everything from laptops to car makers. Micron said on Wednesday that its investments in fiscal year 2023 would now be adjusted down to $7 billion to $7.5 billion and that it would be significantly reducing CapEx plans in fiscal year 2024. It invested $12 billion in the 2022 financial year. Micron, the first major chipmaker to alert the market of the downturn over the summer, previously said it would be cutting investments in 2023. It was not clear what its previous 2024 investment plans were, however. Revenue for the first quarter ending on November 30 fell by about 47% year on year to $4.09 billion. It had a net loss of $195 million or 18 cents per share, compared with a profit of $2.31 billion or $2.04 per share a year earlier. All right, well that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calcone Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Denmark will donate $42.8 million in military aid to Ukraine, the country's defence minister said on Wednesday. The money will be donated via the UK-led International Fund for Ukraine, used to provide military equipment and other support to Ukraine's armed forces. Thanks for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calcine Media. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Moscow protests to France over comments about attack on Russian official 
in Africa. Russia's foreign ministry in a statement on Wednesday said it had summoned the French ambassador and lodged a strong protest over comments about an assassination attempt on a Russian official in the Central African Republic. French Foreign Minister Catherine Colonna last week dismissed the claims by the head of a Russian private militia who blamed France for the attack. She called it a good example of Russian propaganda and a fanciful imagination that sometimes characterises this propaganda. Thanks so much for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calkine Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkine Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Kalkine Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on untraceable events. With me today is Tracy Leparulo, founder and CEO from Untraceable Events. Welcome, Tracy. Great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Now, first off, Tracy, we'd love to hear more about Untraceable. What can you tell us about the company? Absolutely. Uh, I've been part of crypto since 2012. Uh, when I went to Kenya and I started a microfinance program there. Uh, so very early on, I got involved in the Canadian crypto community here in Toronto, where Ethereum started out of. And so what Untraceable does is we build community. We've been running events and marketing activations around the world for the last almost a decade now in the crypto space. Uh, and we focus primarily on large scale events and, and how to engage people of all audiences to get involved in cryptocurrency and really bring blockchain technology to, to real life. So you mentioned there you started quite early out within your interest in crypto. So from that, where did the idea for Untraceable come from? You know, it was a natural progression with how it kind of happened. Uh, I got very fortunate because Ethereum started in Toronto. Uh, so I got very early on the Ethereum project and got hired by the, the founders of Ethereum to help them launch. Uh, and that's really kind of the birth of Untraceable. So we ran the largest event at the time. It was 800 people. Uh, and now our events go up to almost 10,000 people uh, here in Canada. And so um, it's really just been an evolution of bringing the community together uh, with, of course, uh, with the just, you know, multiple you know, bull markets helping to grow this community as well. And I believe Untraceable held the first Bitcoin Expo in Canada. What can you tell me about that? Absolutely. So this was back in 2014. Um, like I mentioned, we uh, Ethereum was the title sponsor there. So we launched them at that event. Um, we also ran one of the first Ethereum hackathons at the time. But it's so interesting to see how the community has changed since 2014. It was definitely much more of a social entrepreneur, libertarian movement. Uh, the focus was really just Bitcoin um, with the first time people kind of heard of what's blockchain technology beyond Bitcoin. And that's where Vitalik came out and explained Ethereum for the first time. And um, ever since then, you know, it's just been a really big growth in the whole sector. And it's been amazing to see how much it's grown uh, to our most recent conference, Futures Conference, uh, which was last week at around 6,000 people. And how important do you feel it is to run the hackathons? 
It is so important, especially in things like a downturn market right now, uh, to have things like hackathons. So if you know what a hackathon is, is we bring developers and engineers together from all around the world to build technology and compete on prizes. And so we have sponsors and companies that come in with real world problems they're trying to solve, techno to focus on specifically the technology, and we connect to developers that could actually build these solutions. A lot of, I've been doing hackathons since, since uh, the early days and a lot of big projects have come out of some of the events that I've run. A perfect example was in 2017, CryptoKitties. One of the first most famous NFT projects came out of a hackathon that I ran. And so it's important to bring these communities together, to bring these developers together. They cross-pollinate skill sets. They, they, they usually around 72 hours, they stay up all night long. Uh, and they get to work on these technologies that are actually going to drive our industry and innovation forward. Um, and so, you know, the hackathons in specifically um, are so important to the industry to build community, to build the engineers, and to real get real world applications that ideally uh, become real real projects in the space. It sounds absolutely fabulous and such an exciting space to be in. And um, looking towards the future, what future plans do you have for Untraceable? So what we did at this last event is we gamified the full experience. We provided codes and points associated with doing everything on site. Uh, and so what we did is we brought block blockchain to real life to gamify an experience on site to drive real world actions. So if you can imagine, you would get points in cryptocurrency if you went to sponsor booths, if you went to speaker sessions, if you recycled at the event. And so what we're really excited about is how do we bring and change real life actions using token, token economics, using a cryptocurrency to incentivize people to change their habits on site. You know, it's been a rough year, a rough few years for anyone in the event space in COVID because of COVID-19. And it was so incredible to see the turnout. And what we're really trying to do is bring technology to real life to continue engagement, to continue and foster innovation and to just to get people connected more and more. It absolutely seems like an area that is just set to grow and grow. Thank you so much for your time today, Tracy. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And that was Tracy Lavarulo, founder and CEO from Untraceable Events. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Calchi Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel Jones reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calchine. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media.
Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks here on Calkine TV. In this episode, I'll be sitting down with Victoria Costa, the CEO of Credifix. Victoria, great to have you here with us today. Hi, thank you, James. Well, Victoria, first and foremost, what does Credifix do? What do we do? What have we done? I think is probably a better answer. In the last eight years, we've helped thousands of Australian families to fix and improve their credit reports so they in turn can get on with their wealth creation journey. So in fact, over the last eight years, we've probably inadvertently written thousands more home loans and got families out of the rental market and into being a homeowner. Yeah, it's a very important thing, especially when you consider how bad the housing crisis is at the moment. I know I'm personally saving for a house. Mm -hmm. Might never come at the rate things are going at the moment, that's for sure. But I want to take you back to those eight years ago. Why did you decide to create Credit Fix? Was there something that struck you and you were like, I need to, I need to help out here? What was it? Oh, definitely, for sure. I've always been in the finance industry. I've been in the finance game for 20 years now, so pretty much showing my age. But I was always in the mortgage processing side of things. And then I went through a divorce and I was a single mum and I understood how credit repair worked and I struggled myself to remove a default from my credit report. And then when I looked at the credit repair market, there were so many credit repair companies, but they were all charging up front. Now, credit repair is never guaranteed and I didn't like that. And although I thought, you know, I'd be good at this, you know, I'd be great for, you know, at advocating on behalf of people. Um, so I thought, well, why don't I do credit repair? I'll just start a small business. I was just based in a little housing commission unit in uh, Paramassa in Western Sydney. And I thought mm. I'll just serve some local finance brokers and say, hey, listen, I can help you with your credit repair needs for your clients, but your clients will only pay if I'm successful. And Credit Fix Solutions was born. I think it's a brilliant concept. I mean, we, we look at that in the legal profession, of course, at the moment, where it's a, for a lot of those different firms, it's a case of no win, no fee. So it's, um, it's, it's great that you can actually put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, and it's proof within the pudding. Uh, just before I let you go, are there more people getting into bad financial positions these days, or is it kind of still uh, an issue that seems to be, I suppose, the same as it was, say, 10 to 20 years ago? All I can say is that over the years I've been doing this, most of our clients have gone through difficult times. So divorce, illness, death of a loved one. It's not that they're bad people, they've just been through bad times. Although there are those that do just accumulate debt, but then circumstances change. According to Equifax, one in three people have bad credit in Australia. So this is affecting a lot of people. And what we're seeing since COVID is that that number has increased. Um, natural disasters, economic impacts, loss of work. Uh, many, many people have been affected um, by all of this whole situation we've been through the last couple of years. Yeah, it's certainly been a pretty tumultuous period between floods, fires, and of course, as you mentioned, the pandemic. So it's been a lot to contend with, that is for sure. Uh, just before I let you go, where can we find you on social media? Do you have Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? Yeah, look, we're everywhere. LinkedIn, you can find me, Victoria Costa, on LinkedIn and also our website, creditfixsolutions.com.au. Brilliant. Well, Victoria, thank you so much for your time today and hopefully we can chat more in depth in future. Thanks, James. Thank you. Well, it's Victoria Costa, the CEO of Credit Fix, and if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, so make sure to subscribe. I'm James Preston reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkine Media.
Britain's Princess of Wales paid tribute to Queen Elizabeth at a carol service in Westminster Abbey, saying the royal family's first Christmas without the late monarch would feel very different. King Charles, accompanied by Queen Consort Camilla, joined his son Prince William, Kate and other members of the family at the service at the Abbey, where Elizabeth's funeral was held in September. The carol service took place last week and will be broadcast on Saturday. Kate, who is William's wife and became Princess of Wales after Charles ascended to the throne, hosted the event and dedicated it to Queen Elizabeth and all those who are sadly no longer with us. Queen Elizabeth died on September the 8th, age 96, after 70 years on the throne. The family presented a united front at the service on the 15th of December, the same day that the final episodes of Prince Harry and his wife Meghan's Netflix documentary series were released. Harry, who stepped down from royal duties in 2020, piled fresh criticism on his family in the series, including accusing his older brother William of screaming at him during a summit to discuss his future. So what do you think? Is there a united front from the royal family these days? Leave a comment below. You can also subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for more of our videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Thousands of British ambulance workers will stage two further strikes on January 11th and 23rd in an escalating dispute over pay and staffing the Unison Trade Union stead on Thursday after a similar walkout by staff on Wednesday. While Wednesday's strike, which also involved workers affiliated to two other trade unions, lasted 12 hours, the two Unison strikes next month will last 24 hours each, Unison said in a statement. The walkouts will involve all ambulance employees as opposed to just emergency response crews, although many will be exempted from strike action under emergency cover plans, said the union, which represents the majority of ambulance workers in Britain. It's only through talks that this dispute will end, Unison General Secretary Christina McAnier said. No health workers want to go out on strike again in the new year. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The strikes come as an already pressured health system faces further strain this winter, with nurses also going on strike in a separate pay dispute. British Health Minister Steve Barclay said meeting unions pay demands would mean taking money away from frontline services. Strikes are in no one's best interest least of all patients and I urge unions to reconsider further strike action before walkouts have a worse impact on patients, he said in a statement. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, comment, keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Hello, I'm James and thanks for joining me on Calkine TV for the ASX buzzing stocks of the day. The S&P ASX 200 is up 0.4% in early trade with gains among all four big banks. 
helping the financial sector add 0.5 per cent. The leading sector is consumer discretionary, up 0.6 per cent, with aristocrat leisure advancing by 3 per cent. The worst performing sector is energy, up by 0.1 per cent. Woodside is up by 1.6 per cent and gold prices rose over 1 per cent, hovering near the $1,900 mark per ounce pivot on Thursday after data showing signs of cooling inflation in the United States boosted bets for slower rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. Ginderlee Resources has today announced that it has successfully completed the spin-out and initial public offering of dynamic metals with the ASX code DYM. The IPO received strong support from Jindalee shareholders and new investors with the offers to raise up to a maximum of $7 million closing oversubscribed. Dynamic shares allotted under the IPO were issued on the 11th of January 2023. The ASX has advised that Dynamic has been admitted to the official list of the ASX and is expected to commence trading on the ASX at 9am on Monday, 16th of January 2023. The spin-out of Jindalee's Australian assets via Dynamic will allow the company to focus on its McDermott Lithium project, a very large and strategically important domestic source of lithium for the US battery industry. Jindalee will hold 12.5 million Dynamic shares, equivalent to 25.5% of Dynamic's issued capital post listing, providing Jindalee shareholders with an indirect interest in Dynamic's projects. Moving on in San Francisco-based Life360 today confirmed a continued strong fourth quarter of 2022 momentum and announced an accelerated plan to achieve positive operating cash flow and adjusted EBITDA. The company said a workforce restructuring announced today and implemented following completion of the full operational merger of Gyobit, Tile and Life360 in 2022. This will enable the streamlining of operations of the consolidated business units to drive lower operating expenses and the sharpened focus on the company's key strategic product initiatives to enhance its leadership in family safety and security. Together with continuing strong subscription revenues, the restructure is expected to deliver positive operating cash flow and adjusted EBITDA from the second quarter of 2023, a quarter earlier than previously announced with positive operating cash flow and adjusted EBITDA for the full year of 2023. And lastly, Lithium Power International announced that the company this week commenced a drilling program at its East Kirup Lithium Prospect. It's part of the company's Green Bushes project in the southwest of Western Australia. East Kirup is located 20 kilometres northwest along the Donnybrook shear zone from Green Bushes, Australia's largest lithium mine, which is operated by Talison Lithium. All right, that's all for this edition of the ASX Buzzing Stocks of the Day. Another episode is coming your way on Monday, but until then, make sure to keep it locked here on Kalkine TV for the latest market insights and business news. I'm James, signing off for now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFT's? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Bitcoin mining may be characterized as a record keeping process that uses computer processing power to add a transaction.
to a publicly distributed ledger known as a blockchain, which retains records of every Bitcoin transaction. It is one of the most common ways to generate Bitcoin in the cryptocurrency market. Right now, Calcane is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. According to Coinbase, mining is a process through which Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies produce new coins and validate new transactions. It entails massive decentralized networks of computers all over the world that verify and safeguard blockchains, which are virtual ledgers that record Bitcoin transactions. Computers in the network are rewarded with fresh coins in exchange for contributing processing power. There is no direct way to determine the amount of energy consumed by Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining. However, the quantity may be calculated based on the network's hash rate and the consumption of commercially available mining rigs. Cryptocurrency mining also creates a lot of electrical trash since mining hardware wears out rapidly. And this is especially true for ASIC application specific integrated circuit miners, which are specialized equipment built to mine the most popular cryptocurrencies. According to DigiEconomist, the Bitcoin network generates around 38,000 tons of electronic garbage annually. Calculating cryptocurrencies carbon impact is more difficult. Although fossil fuels are the most common form of energy in most nations, where Bitcoin's mined, miners need to seek the most cost-effective energy sources in order to remain profitable. Thanks for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Kelkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. According to London-based global health intelligence and analytics from Airfinity has shown in its analysis that between 1.3 and 2.1 million lives could be at risk if China lifts zero COVID policy given low vaccination and booster rates, as well as a lack of hybrid immunity. According to the research, Hong Kong had a zero COVID policy throughout the first two years of the epidemic. As a result, when the highly transmissible Omicron BA.1 sublineage emerged in February, population immunity was low. This along with insufficient vaccination coverage resulted in a massive wave of illnesses and fatalities, particularly among the elderly. According to the survey, mainland China's population has relatively low levels of immunity. Its population were immunized with Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines, which have been shown to have much inferior efficiency and give less protection against illness and mortality. Right now, Calcane is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data driven market insights combined with an in depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. This vaccine induced immunity has diminished over time and the population is increasingly vulnerable to severe illness with poor booster uptake and no natural infections. China's current booster uptake in over 80s is 40%, whereas Hong Kong's primary series uptake was 34% in February 2022, when the BA.1 Omicron variant caused a huge rise in cases. Airfinity's Head of Vaccines and Epidemiology, Dr. Louise Blair, said it is essential for China to ramp up vaccinations to raise immunity to lift its zero COVID policy. 
especially given how large its elderly population is. And subsequently, China would need hybrid immunity to allow the country to brace future waves with minimal impact. The research also stated that China's zero COVID approach also implies that the population has essentially no naturally developed immunity due to past infection. As a result of these factors, their study indicates that if China experiences a comparable wave to Hong Kong in February, its healthcare system might be strained with between 167 and 279 million cases nationally, resulting in between 1.3 to 2.1 million fatalities. Thanks so much for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. More than a dozen new electric vehicle models are said to reach Australia in 2023, including Chinese manufactured EVs from BYD and MG. That's according to a report from the ABC. BYD is China's largest car maker and a major battery manufacturer, while MG is backed by Chinese state-owned car company SAIC Motor. During the first three quarters of 2022, a total of 26,356 EVs were sold. A share of the new vehicles sold in Australia that were EVs EVs increased to 3.39% on a year-to-date basis as of September 2022 compared with 2.05% the year before, which represented a 65% increase in the market share of EV sales in 2022. According to the report, rapidly growing interest from consumers wanting to make the switch to an electric vehicle has seen some models sold out within minutes of being made available for purchase. The Tesla Model 3 continued to dominate EV sales until September last year, accounting for 33% of new EVs sold. Despite the first deliveries of the Model Y starting only in August 2022, this model has already skyrocketed to second place on the sales chart, representing 20% of new EV sales. In February 2022, BYD hit the Australia passenger vehicle market with a TTO3, the first A-class SUV built upon BYD e-platform 3.0 which was jointly launched in China and Australia and began pre-sales in Australia. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below and share your thoughts. You can also share this video and like and subscribe to our channel. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. This is Rachel for Kalkai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's crypto buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkai. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkai TV. My name's Sage. Today's guest is Taylor Monaghan. She's the global product lead at Midamask. 
And for some background, MetaMask is one of the leading digital wallet providers in the world. Tech giants are becoming more interested in possibilities that Web3 could bring. And MetaMask is a spoke in the consensus ecosystem of companies, which is a leading Ethereum and decentralized protocol software company you may have heard of when their valuation doubled to $7 billion after investment from Microsoft in March 2022. They enable developers, enterprises and people worldwide to build next generation applications to make the decentralized web more accessible. So, here to tell us more about what they do and a new initiative from MetaMask Grants DAO is a DAO member herself, Taylor Monaghan. Welcome to the show, Taylor. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, well, congrats on this new venture with $2.4 million being available for Web3 Innovations per year through this new DAO. Can you help us understand a bit more about how the MetaMask Grants DAO promotes decentralized Web3 infrastructure? Of course. Um, so the thing about, uh, I guess, the world that we're living in or trying to build today is that um, we have big dreams for the future but we're sort of still a little bit stuck in the traditional way of doing things. And so in order to help us get from point A to point B, we've initiated this, this grand style um, and we're gonna experiment and we're gonna have some fun and we're most importantly gonna uh, get some money into the hands of the people in the ecosystem so that they can build uh, whatever future we wanna be building. Wow, that sounds really exciting. This isn't the first initiative of a, a DAO project like this. You've had mm -hmm. other ones, Village DAO, I believe, and there was an NFT project as well. So for this particular DAO, will more education and innovation in Web3 cloud-based and low-code functionality be privileged, or is it more about wallet interoperability? Um, so there are a variety of goals that we have with this particular DAO. Um, I think that one of the things that we really want to do is we want to give back to the ecosystem and we want to, um, again, help drive innovation. Um, and on top of that, we want to see, you know, if there's actual money on the line, can we make decisions as a decentralized group of people? Can we come to agreements on things? And how does that look and where are the bottlenecks? Because if we want to, you know, scale this up and include more and more people into this decision making body, we're going to need to start somewhere. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, the idea of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, sounds great. But there's also issues of invoicing in a decentralized ecosystem of companies and how that works. And if people's knowledge is not up to, you know, standard, does that mean they're going to miss out on opportunities? And well, do you have anything to share on that? So I think that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we're taking this approach is that we want to see exactly what the problems are um, as we were discussing the variety of DAOs or the variety of even just centralized things that we could do. Um, it's very easy to get caught up on the what ifs, right? Like what if this happens or what if nobody's interested in that or what if we need to do X, Y, and Z? Um, and it can really, it can, it can cause you to just not do anything and so with this, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, we're pretty confident that we can get, um, you know, this group of people to make <laughs> some decisions together. And we're going to see exactly where uh, the lack of education is, uh, where the interest is, um, and most importantly, you know, hopefully get uh, all of the kinks ironed out so that we can expand it to a, a, a much, much wider audience. Sounds great. Best of luck with it. Well, uptake of wallets has been huge every month. There are hundreds and thousands of wallets being downloaded in the US alone, although it may have dropped off a bit uh, this year. Mm -hmm. But working in a permissionless open source environment, how is bug-free code from SDK's integrity maintained? And what are the best Web3 platforms to use in order to learn how to innovate, please? Yeah, so it is, uh, I think user safety and the security of our product is is by far the most important thing that we do, um, especially when we're talking about some of the, uh, the on-chain applications, which are actually fully decentralized and actually fully autonomous. Uh, if something goes wrong, it goes really wrong really fast. Um, you know, we're, we're at MetaMask, we're lucky enough to be within the consensus family. So we have Truffle, which is some amazing developer tools. They have a whole variety of stuff that helps you write code, test code, deploy code. 
Um, and then Infura is uh, sort of the other, the other half of the wallet, which is the thing that actually interacts with the blockchain. Um, and those are all consensus products. Um, but most importantly, I think that it's the, the mindset that you have going into this ecosystem. You have to be really aware that uh, this world is quite different and it's quite unique. Uh, and there's actual money on the line. Like we are actually, uh, we're enabling people to take control of their own funds, their own futures, their own financial livelihoods. And as empowering as that can be, it can also be um, detrimental if something goes wrong. So uh, that's where we are. We're getting better every day and, uh, you know, we'll get there. Absolutely. I mean, it's such an interesting space at the moment because it takes a village to get a project off the ground, as you know. Um, but there's so many more new innovations with uh, other industries like film coming into it and using blockchain for things like uh, contracts and NFTs to have better distribution and funding models, for example. But how are advances in computer vision and self-supervised learning technology like Meta AI and DAL E also impacting Web3, please? I think that, you know, as you said, it, it takes a village and it's it's uh, that's truly the case when we're dealing on such like the, the frontiers of innovation. Um, you know, it's uh, every single thing has to come together across the whole stack. Uh, we need different people. We need different technologies. We need people with a more traditional mindset uh, and we need the most cutting edge innovation on the technical end. Um, and really the only way that we're ever going to succeed is if all of these things come together and work together and learn how to uh, interoperate and communicate. Um, and, you know, if we get to a point where we can actually have valuable conversations and actually bring the variety of technologies and people around the world together, then I have no doubt that we can we can empower all the people around the globe to, you know, again, take control of their finances, take control of their identities, take control of uh yeah, I guess whatever future they want to have for themselves. Yeah, well, look, as an outsider looking in, it seems that blockchain has an ability to divide. It's got the power to divide because there's so many people putting their efforts in, but a lot of money is pouring into tech projects. All you've got to say, it's a tech project and everyone wants to invest in it. At times, it can seem that way when you're just looking in as an outsider. But um, things like mobile AR applications in, in e-commerce are, are pulsing now. How much of a part do you think they'll play in Web3? And do you think the paradigm's going to shift from data storage, payment transfers, and distributed ledger functions with the Web3 development that, that's continuing? Yeah, so I think that um, it's uh, it's easy to get caught up in the hype, and these things are a bit cyclical. So, you know, uh, yesterday it was blockchain, today it's AR, tomorrow it's something else. Um, and I kind of try to look at the and really ask, like, what's the value and what are we, you know, um, what are people trying to accomplish with this technology or with these words? And I think that we're seeing very consistent themes around, um, you know, different ways of coordinating, like socially coordinating people. Uh, different ways of people coming together and using the technology to actually improve their lives, whether that's AR, whether that's VR, whether that's AI, whether that's blockchain. It's it's really about um, again, you know, we we've we've successfully sort of broken down the board physically, right? We can now work together uh, remotely. We can work together with people around the entire globe. Um, but then, you know, how can we use the technology and the tools to uh, further enhance our productivity? And, and further uh, improve how we work together and uh, how we create value in this new world. Wow, the wheels are definitely in motion and talking today has really meant a lot to me. I know this is just brand new, hot off the press, so thank you so mm -hmm. much for making time to share your news with me at Calkine. Um, was there anything you'd like to share with us before you go? How can people get involved? Yeah, I mean, definitely come check us out. Uh, if you want to sort of talk directly with us, it's at MetaMask on Twitter. Uh, my name is Taylor Monaghan. You can just say my name and I'll appear, I guess. <laughs> uh, but I think most importantly is, um, you know, uh, the crypto markets, they tend to go up and they go down. And if you get caught up in the hype, it can be uh, a bit of a whirlwind. But I just want to remind people that, you know, what we're building and what we're trying to do is, is in my opinion, immensely valuable. And it's not uh, just about the money, right? It's about actually furthering innovation and using the innovations to better our lives and the societies that we live in. Um, and I would definitely invite anyone who's sort of maybe uh, on the edge of the ecosystem looking in 
to, to dip a toe in, um, you know, now is better than a year ago, simply because it's not the hype, it's not the, the, the money raining from the skies and the people that were there for, for uh, maybe the greed and the hype over the, the value and the creation of new things. So I'm definitely around, we're all around, we're here and we're eager to, to share this new world with, with everyone. Sounds fantastic. It's a really exciting space to be researching. Thank you so much again. And Thank you so much you for having me. Us. We just had a really great discussion with Taylor Monahan. If you missed any part of that, please feel free to go to our YouTube channel, Calcai Media, and watch it there. Keep watching for more of these live expert talks on the cutting edge new technology, blockchain, and crypt cryptocurrencies, as well as business and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calcai Media. The New Zealand government said on Wednesday it would not require travellers from China to produce a negative COVID-19 test, bucking a trend that has seen a number of nations implement such measures as cases surge in China. New Zealand's COVID-19 minister, Aisha Verrill, said in a statement that a public health risk assessment had concluded visitors from China would not contribute significantly to the number of cases in the country. A number of countries, including Britain, the United States and Australia, have demanded that travellers from China produce a negative COVID-19 test over concerns about the scale of the country's outbreak and scepticism over Beijing's health statistics. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The move has been criticised by Chinese state media as discriminatory. Infections in China have spiked after the country dropped its strict zero cases policy on December 7, allowing the virus to spread. All international arrivals in New Zealand are asked to test if they become symptomatic and the country provides free tests at the airport. Officials will be asking some travellers from China to do voluntary testing to gather more information, which Verrill said reflected New Zealand's concern alongside that of the World Health Organisation about China's lack of information sharing. New Zealand is also planning to trial testing wastewater on international flights to see if this can replace targeted and voluntary testing of individuals. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.
South Korea and the United States are discussing joint planning and implementation of US nuclear operations to counter North Korea. Seoul's presidential office said on Tuesday, January 3, although US President Joe Biden said there would be no joint nuclear exercises. The statement came shortly after Biden said the United States was not discussing joint nuclear exercises with South Korea, seeming to contradict earlier remarks by South Korean President Yoon Suk-yul in an interview with a local newspaper. Yoon's press secretary, Kim un hai said Biden had no choice but to say no because he was simply asked if the two countries were discussing nuclear war games, whereas joint nuclear exercises can only be held between nuclear weapon states. A senior US administration official reiterated Biden's comments, saying that joint nuclear exercises with Seoul would be extremely difficult because Seoul is not a nuclear power, but that the Allies are looking at enhanced information sharing, joint contingency planning, and an eventual tabletop exercise. Both presidents have asked their teams after a meeting in Cambodia in November to explore ways to address North Korea's recent actions and statements, which have caused increasing concern according to officials. Neither side has finalised the timing of the planned tabletop exercises, but they would take place in the not too distant future and cover scenarios beyond nuclear situations, according to officials. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. A National Security Council spokesperson said in a statement that the United States is committed to providing extended deterrence and that the Allies are working on an effective coordinated response to a range of scenarios, including nuclear use by North Korea. Alright, that's all for this video, but don't forget to like, share and comment. And for more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Fundamental analysis determines a company's inherent worth by examining its financial, economic, qualitative and quantitative variables. It's commonly used when investors want to make a long-term investment in a company. However, in exceptional scenario investing, such as buybacks, rights issues, mergers and acquisitions and much more, fundamental analytical skills are needed to benefit in the near term. The fundamental analysis enables an investor to drown out the short-term sounds surrounding the firm and focus on the long-term potential. For fundamental analysis to make a spending choice, several criteria must be considered. The general economic state, the performance of the asset or the company's relevant sectors, geopolitical or internal political repercussions, market competitiveness and many other aspects are examples of macroeconomic considerations. Furthermore, for fundamental analysis, it's necessary to examine the company's top management or executive team. Meanwhile, some microeconomic factors such as demand and supply, the labour market, manufacturing and transportation expenses and so on should also be considered. Analysts might differentiate one company or asset from another through fundamental research, regardless of their industries, market value or other factors. Fundamental analysts often search for executive team members, their backgrounds, past experience, accomplishments or failures and so on while evaluating the management team. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. 
subscribe for the free trial now. To analyze the company's performance, fundamental analysis, examine for profit or loss statements, cash flow, sales growth, and other critical indicators in its filings. All of these characteristics distinguish a fundamental analysis from technical analysis, which primarily focuses on quantitative data. On the other hand, fundamental analysis seek quantitative and qualitative data. So what do you think? You can like and subscribe to our channel. You can press the bell icon for video notifications and you can leave a comment below. I'm Rachel for Kalki Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalki Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalki Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to Zerocoin. Hi there, I'm James for Kalki Media. As the COVID-19 pandemic has turned life on its head, many companies and employees have turned to remote work to maintain productivity and safety. While the shift to remote work was initially seen as a temporary solution, it's increasingly becoming a permanent fixture in the world of work. In fact, a recent survey found that 82% of companies plan to allow their employees to continue working remotely at least some of the time, even after the pandemic well and truly ends. But what does the future of remote work look like? One possibility is that remote work will become the new normal with more and more companies embracing the idea of a decentralized workforce. This could lead to a proliferation of digital nomads, individuals who are able to work from anywhere in the world with an internet connection. Another possibility is that companies will adopt a hybrid model, where employees are able to work both remotely and in the office. This would allow for the benefits of both worlds, such as the ability to collaborate in person with colleagues and the convenience of working from home. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Regardless of the specific model, it is clear that remote work is here to stay. This shift will have significant implications for the way we work from the design of our homes to the way we collaborate with colleagues. One of the biggest challenges of remote work is the lack of face-to-face -face interaction. To address this, companies are turning to technology such as virtual reality and augmented reality to create a sense of presence and facilitate remote meetings. These technologies are still in their infancy, but they have the potential to revolutionize the way we work and collaborate. Another challenge of remote work is the blurring of boundaries between work and home life. To address this, it's important for employees to establish clear boundaries and for companies to provide support for maintaining a healthy work-life balance. Now, in any event, the future of remote work is uncertain, but it is clear that it will play a significant role in the way we work. Whether it's through the proliferation of digital nomads, the adoption of a hybrid model, or the use of new technologies, remote work is sure to bring about exciting changes and opportunities in the world of work. All right, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston for Kalki Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalki Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalki Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to Zerocoin. Thank you.
Due to unexpected occurrences that have unfolded throughout the years, the crypto markets have been volatile. Many crypto enterprises have gone bankrupt over the years as a result of massive hacks, scams or mismanagement, resulting in the loss of billions of dollars in investor capital. On that note, let's look at some crypto companies that have recently gone bankrupt. FTX. Following a Coindesk investigation detailing probable leverage and solvency risks regarding FTX-affiliated trading company Alameda Research, FTX crashed in early November 2022. The collapse of FTX shocked the volatile cryptocurrency market, which lost billions at the time and fell below a $1 trillion valuation. By 11th November 2022, FTX's CEO Sam Bankman-Fried resigned and the firm declared bankruptcy. Following that, FTX faced a potential attack in which hundreds of millions of tokens were taken. In late December, FTX founder and ex-CEO Sam Bankman-Fried was arrested in the Bahamas and extradited to the United States. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. BlockFi, following the catastrophic downfall of FTX. BlockFi filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States on the 28th of November 2022. And FTX had actually given the exchange 400 million US dollars earlier in 2022 in a bid to preserve BlockFi with the collapse of FTX. The task got considerably more difficult for BlockFi, which was once valued at 3 billion US dollars. And BlockFi has previously warned that it was considering filing for bankruptcy after deciding to suspend withdrawals on 10th November. The decision to declare bankruptcy was taken to allow BlockFi to stabilize its company and arrange for a full reorganization while working through a list of alternatives. Celsius Network a crypto lending and staking platform declared bankruptcy in June 2022 due to a liquidity issue created by the crypto bear market. The Luna UST disaster exacerbated Celsius's problems and drove the company further into debt. Celsius filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and revealing that of its total liabilities of 5.5 billion US dollars, 4.7 billion US dollars owed to its consumers following a particularly challenging time for cryptocurrencies. The UK-based lending company was forced to shut all operations in June. Three Arrows Capital. Three Arrows was the first big crypto company to go bankrupt back in 2022, following the May 2022 collapse of cryptocurrencies Luna and Terra USD. In late June, it declared bankruptcy in the British Virgin Islands. That court appointed liquidators to close down the company and settle its debts. Thanks so much for watching. It's been a tumultuous year for cryptocurrencies. Please do be careful when investing in the space. Keep watching Calcine for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Hi there, I'm James for Calcine Media. If you've been paying attention to the world of finance, you've probably heard of exchange traded funds or ETFs. These popular investment vehicles have been around for decades and allow investors to easily diversify their portfolios by buying a basket of assets in a single transaction. But what about cryptocurrency ETFs? A crypto ETF is essentially the same as a traditional ETF, with one key difference. Instead of being invested in stocks, bonds or other traditional assets, a crypto ETF is invested in cryptocurrencies. This means that when you buy shares in a crypto ETF, you are essentially buying a small piece of a diversified portfolio of various cryptocurrencies. So how does a crypto ETF work? 
It all starts with the fund manager, who is responsible for creating and maintaining the ETF. The fund manager will research and select a basket of cryptocurrencies to include in the ETF, and then buy those cryptocurrencies on behalf of the ETF. Right now, Calcane is offering a 7-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The fund manager will also determine the ETF's price and oversee its trading on an exchange. Investors can then buy and sell shares in the ETF just like they would with any other security, using their brokerage account or through a financial advisor. The value of the ETF will rise and fall based on the value of the underlying cryptocurrencies. While crypto ETFs can offer many benefits, it is important to keep in mind that they are not without risk. Like any other investment, the value of a crypto ETF can fluctuate, and it's possible to lose money if the price of the underlying cryptocurrency starts to decline. In addition, the cryptocurrency market is still relatively new and highly volatile, which means that prices can swing wildly in a short period of time. Overall, crypto ETFs offer a convenient and accessible way for investors to gain exposure to the cryptocurrency market, but it is important to carefully consider the risk and do your own research before you invest. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. It's been a tough time for the global economy following a two-year period of global lockdowns thanks to the COVID pandemic, coupled with an ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The main symptom of the global economic health has been high levels of inflation. It's this factor which has influenced fiscal policy, including the rising of interest rates. But how long will these high levels of inflation last? It's difficult to predict with certainty just how long global inflation will last, as it is influenced by a variety of economic and political factors. One of the main drivers of inflation is the balance between supply and demand in the economy. When demand for goods and services exceeds the available supply, prices can rise. This can be caused by factors such as strong consumer spending, economic growth, and increasing the cost of production. Inflation can also be influenced by monetary policy, such as the actions of central banks. For example, if a central bank decides to increase the money supply, it can lead to higher prices as more money chases the same amount of goods and services. There are also external factors that can impact inflation, such as natural disasters or geopolitical tensions, which can disrupt supply chains and drive up costs. Overall, the long-term outlook for global inflation will depend on the interplay of these various factors and how they evolve over time. While it's difficult to make precise predictions, most economists expect inflation to remain relatively stable in the long run, as long as there are no major shocks to the economy. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, 
the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Automobile manufacturer Renault is considering building a mass market electric vehicle in India as part of a renewed push into a market where EV adoption is expected to grow quickly from a small base. News agency Reuters have been told by two people with knowledge of the ongoing review. The study by Renault underscores how the French automaker is pushing ahead with electrification plans, even as it extends unresolved negotiations with its partner Nissan Motor about investing in an EV unit it plans to carve out from its other operations. It also points to the shifting perception of the auto market in India, which posted the fastest growth of any major market in 2022. EVs are on track to be less than 1% of car sales last year, but the government has set a target of 30% by 2030 and has had recent success in attracting suppliers for international automakers with a range of subsidies. Reuters discover the Renault is looking to launch a made in India electric version of its quid hatchback. The review will assess potential demand, pricing, and the ability to build the EV with local components, said one of the people, adding that any launch would be in late 2024. The move is part of a broader plan by Renault to rekindle sales in a country where the car maker remains profitable, despite selling fewer cars in 2022 than a year earlier. Renault India declined to comment on product plans, but said the company has a strong focus on electrification globally. India is said to become the world world's third largest market for passenger and other light vehicles, displacing Japan, according to a forecast by S&P Global Mobility. Industry-wide sales grew an estimated 23% to 4.4 million vehicles in 2022. That's the contrast to the outlook for the United States, where the market's expected to remain below 2019 levels next year, and China, where demand is weakening. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon for video notifications. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Artificial intelligence, a popular and frequently utilized technology, basically supplies robots with the ability to do a certain activity, minimizing human labor. This is made feasible by implementing specialized programming languages, tools and procedures, or codes, into the machine to accomplish jobs with little or no human participation. The scope of artificial intelligence is vast and expanding every day. Scientists began to consider this technology in the early 20th century. Alan Turing is considered amongst the most extraordinary scientists of the 20th century, who created history by laying a strong theoretical foundation of computer science. He was a mathematician, a cryptanalyst, logician, and philosopher. In an article in 1936, he suggested a theoretical device based on the idea that a machine may copy any other machine. 
John McCarthy created the term artificial intelligence in 1956. He described AI as applying science and engineering to the creation of intelligent machines. It refers to creating a computer system capable of doing tasks that normally require human intellect, such as speech recognition, decision making, visual perception and language translation. There are three types of artificial intelligence, artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence. Now, narrow intelligence or weak AI is when artificial intelligence is applied to a narrow activity. In contrast, artificial general intelligence or strong AI is when a machine can do intellectual work much like a human. Meanwhile, artificial superintelligence refers to the moment a computer's capabilities exceed that of a human being. The Google predictive search engine is a well-known example of AI. Meanwhile, a well-known investment banking firm accesses its legal document using its contract intelligence platform. The usage of this AI platform significantly shortened the time required to obtain the legal document. Artificial intelligence is also important in self-driving automobiles. AI has far-reaching implications that are beyond one's comprehension. It can revolutionize global economic productivity and GDP potential. Significant investment in numerous AI technologies is required to make this achievable. Now, according to a PwC study that was published in 2017, product innovations would account for 45% of overall economic benefits by 2030. AI would contribute over $15.7 trillion to the global economy, and it would boost the economy by 26% in GDP. So what do you think about the importance of AI? You can leave a comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe and you can press the bell icon for more videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The outbreak of the COVID-19 epidemic weighed on the Chinese economy. Three years of a zero COVID policy sparked huge protests and China's stringent lockdown policy hampered the economy and drove retail sales and industrial output to their lowest since the pandemic's outbreak in early 2020. According to the National Bureau of Statistics of China, the country's industrial output growth, which includes activity in the manufacturing, mining and utility sectors, decreased to a negative 2.9% in April 2022 from 5% in March 2022. The COVID-19 curb significantly impacted China's consumer spending, with retail sales plunging 11.1% year-on-year in April 2022. With millions of citizens restricted to their homes due to the lockdown, consumption dropped significantly. Meanwhile, the Chinese labor market suffered as well, with the unemployment rate rising to 6.1% in April 2022 from 5.8% in March that year, the highest level since February 2020. In April 2022, the unemployment rate among young individuals aged 16 to 24 hit an alarming 18.2%. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. In November 2022, the surveyed unemployment rate in urban areas of China ranged at 5.7%, up from 5.5% in the previous month. China's stock market index, the Shanghai Composite, which is widely considered the benchmark for the performance of the Chinese stock market, 
plunged 13.12% between January 2022 and January 2023. World Bank had earlier said that economic growth in China was projected to slow to 4.3% in 2022 before rebounding to a 5.2% in 2023, largely reflecting the economic damage caused by the persistence of COVID-19. Meanwhile, the Chinese government has strongly opposed COVID-19 pandemic testing requirements placed on Chinese travelers and warned of retaliation against countries that impose them, including the United States and many European nations. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and subscribe to our channel. You can also leave a comment and press the bell icon to get more videos from us. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Hey there, I'm James for Kalkai Media, and in this video, we'll be taking a look at one of China's greatest entrepreneurs, Jack Ma. Jack Ma is a Chinese business magnate and philanthropist who is the co-founder and former executive chairman of Alibaba Group, a multinational technology company. Born Ma Yun, he is known for being one of China's richest men and one of the world's most successful entrepreneurs. Ma was born on October 15, 1964 in Hangzhou, China. He grew up in a poor family and struggled academically, failing his college entrance exams twice before finally being accepted to Hangzhou Teachers College. After graduating, he worked as an English teacher for several years before starting his own business. In 1999, Ma co-founded Alibaba Group, which has since become one of the world's largest online and mobile commerce companies. The company operates through a variety of platforms, including the Alibaba.com wholesale platform, the Taobao online shopping platform, and the Tmall retail platform. In 2014, Alibaba's initial public offering on the New York Stock Exchange was the largest in history at the time, raising more than $25 billion. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. As of 2023, Jack Ma has acquired $34 billion in personal wealth, making him the fifth richest person in China. Ma is known for his unconventional leadership style and his commitment to innovation. He's been praised for his vision in building Alibaba into a global company and for his efforts to promote entrepreneurship in China. In addition to his business pursuits, Ma is also a philanthropist and has supported a number of charitable causes, including education, the environment and healthcare. In 2014, he founded the Jack Ma Foundation, which focuses on improving education and the environment in China. Ma announced his retirement from Alibaba in 2019 and handed over the reins to CEO Daniel Zhang. Despite his retirement, Ma remains an influential figure in the business world and is considered one of the most successful entrepreneurs of his generation. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.
There is no sign of a cost of living crunch at Rolls-Royce. The luxury car maker powered to a new sales record in 2022. It sold just over 6,000 cars during the period. That was almost 9% up on 2021, itself a record year. The sales boom comes despite an average price tag for its vehicles of about $534,000. It also comes despite Rolls stopping all sales in Russia, normally the market for a few hundred cars each year. Health crisis-related lockdowns drove a drop in China too. But the company says its sales stayed strong in the Americas, with the US accounting for just over a third. Now, Chief Executive Torsten muller ertwurst says order books are full way into 2023. And they could be set for another big boost. The firm's first electric vehicle will go on sale at the end of the year. Rolls-Royce says pre-orders for the Spectre have far exceeded all expectations. It hasn't revealed a price for the vehicle, but says that is never a big issue for its customers. The company has said it expects to have fully switched to electric power for its cars by the end of the decade. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The BMW Group looks to be staying ahead of its arch rival. That's despite a drop in sales over the year. In 2022, they fell almost 5%, with Europe and China hard hit by supply chain troubles. Deliveries in the US were more stable though, and sales of electric vehicles more than doubled. Sales at its ultra-luxury Rolls-Royce brand also hit a record. All that was just enough to keep BMW in the lead over Mercedes. It sold just over 2 million vehicles during 2022. That was slightly down on a year before, though orders picked up strongly in the fourth quarter. Sales of its high-end Maybach vehicles surged by more than a third. Entry-level vehicles were hit hard, however, as they were the worst affected by supply chain bottlenecks. Tuesday also saw a cautious outlook from Volkswagen. It says 2023 looks volatile, though worries over part supplies are easing. VW says SUVs remain the fastest growing segment, accounting for 80% of all sales in the US. That includes the Bentayga models made by luxury unit Bentley, which also posted record sales. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Natural disasters turned last year into one of the costliest on record. That's according to a key survey from reinsurer Munich Re on Tuesday. It found losses from natural catastrophes covered by insurance came to $120 billion, just short of 2017's record. It's even higher when they include uninsured damages, dragging the total up to $270 billion last year. Munich Re said annual losses over $100 billion appeared to be the new normal. It mostly blamed Hurricane Ian in the US and floods in Australia for last year's big numbers. Hurricane Ian hit Florida in September and caused $60 billion of insured damages. Floods in Australia early in the year and again in October caused $4.7 billion of insured compensation. Pakistan also endured $15 billion in damages, most of it uninsured. 
The country was hit by major floods due to record monsoon rains and faster melting glaciers which killed at least 1,700 people. Scientists said the events in 2022 were made worse by climate change. They also warned there would be more to come as Earth's atmosphere warms through the next decade and beyond. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. From a strangely becalmed Bitcoin to ever deep job cuts at crypto market firms, these are the week's big stories in the world of virtual money. Bitcoin crept higher as the new year started, gaining around 4%, but it stubbornly stuck at around $16,000 to $17,000, with trading volumes very subdued. Bulls say such quiet periods rarely last long and are often followed by sharp gains. Bears say a global economic slowdown will leave people with less cash to spend on crypto. After the virtual roller coaster of last year, a quiet start is good enough for some investors. New York is suing Celsius network founder Alex Mashinsky. I don't think anyone knows uh, how far Bitcoin can go. The city's attorney general says he defrauded investors out of billions of dollars and hid the failing health of his now defunct crypto lending platform. A lawyer for Mashinsky said he denied all the allegations. Coinbase is cutting almost 1,000 jobs. The firm has been hit by the crypto downturn, and Chief Brian Armstrong says the market could face further contagion from the demise of FTX, too. The job cuts follow others at big names in the sector, including Genesis and Hoibi. And Reuters sources say U.S. regulators are investigating financial firms who invested in FTX to see if they did their homework before putting money in. The U.S. government has also launched a website for victims of the collapse to communicate with law enforcement. Former FTX boss Sam Bankman-Fried has pleaded not guilty to fraud charges and faces the trial date in October. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Prince Harry's Spare became the UK's fastest selling non-fiction book ever, its publisher said on Tuesday, after days of TV interviews, leaks and a mistaken early release of the memoir containing intimate revelations about the British royal family. Harry's book has garnered attention around the world with its disclosure about his personal struggles and its accusations about other royals including his father, King Charles, stepmother, Camilla, and elder brother, Prince William. Citing British sales figures, the publisher said it had sold 400,000 copies so far across hardback, ebook, and audio formats. Earlier in the day, Caroline Lennon, a retail worker and one of the eager readers who had headed to bookshops to get their copy on the first day of its release, said she would read the book immediately as she posed for photographers. I like him. I like him. I like the royal family. I was here when Diana bought her book out and um, I just, I queued up then. And uh, now I'm queuing up again and I'm enjoying myself. The only, at the moment, I think the man needs to get himself sorted out because it looks to me like he's carrying the weight of his, the childhood. The death of Diana, he's, he's carrying it all. With that family, there's no love and no passion. It, 
you want that, he wants that back in his life. That, that's where Diana gave him that love. He wants a lot of affection and love. Are you a bit surprised it's just you here today, Caroline? Yeah. You know what, can I just say, I know how Diana feels now. Read it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to the audio. Are you going to read it today? Yeah. Despite the lack of cues, Waterstone said there had been strong pre-orders for the memoir, which currently ranks as the bestseller on Amazon's UK, US, Australian, German and Canadian websites. The royal family has not commented on the book or the interviews and is unlikely to do so. It really is such a, a groundbreaking, groundbreaking uh, book and unprecedented within the royal family. You know, we've seen other books come out in the past. You know, his mother's book, of course, his famous book, her famous book with Andrew Morton, and then Charles also cooperating with the book in the 90s, but nothing quite like this. I mean, the scale of this and the intimate details he shares about, about life within the royal family, there, we haven't seen anything like this before. Extracts from the book were leaked last Thursday when its Spanish language edition also went on sale by mistake in some bookshops in Spain. Harry speaks of his grief and growing up after the death of his mother, Princess Diana, when he was just 12. His use of cocaine and other drugs to cope, how he killed 25 Taliban fighters while serving as a soldier in Afghanistan, and even how he lost his virginity. He also reveals a heated row with William, the heir to the throne, saying his brother knocked him over and how they had both begged his father not to marry Camilla, who he wed in 2005 and is now the Queen Consort. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Ukrainian servicemen fired anti-aircraft guns at Russian positions on Tuesday near Bakhmut. The city is located on a strategic supply line between the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, which make up the Donbas, Ukraine's industrial heartland. Gaining control of Bakhmut could give Russia a platform to advance on two bigger cities, Kramatorsk and Slovyansk. It would also be a welcome battlefield victory for President Vladimir Putin after a series of setbacks in recent months. Kiev said on Tuesday that its troops are facing waves of assaults by Russian forces on a small salt mining town of Solodar. And seizing Solodar would give an advantage to Russian forces as they hope to capture Bakhmut, only a few miles to the southwest. Serhei Chirivati, a spokesperson for Ukraine's eastern forces, said the Russians were deploying their best Wagner fighters at Solodar, which had been struck 86 times by artillery over the past 24 hours. Britain's defense ministry said Russian troops and Wagner fighters were probably now in control of most of the town after advances in the last four days. But in his nightly video address on Monday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Bakhmut and Solodar were holding on despite widespread destruction. Reuters could not verify the battlefield reports. Meanwhile, two British voluntary workers have gone missing after they left the city of Kramatorsk for Solodar on Friday morning, according to Ukrainian police. Authorities said on Monday they were now looking for them. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on Tuesday said Russia was mobilizing more troops for the war in Ukraine and should not be underestimated. And there is no indication that President Putin has changed uh, the overall aim of his uh, uh, brutal war against uh, Ukraine. So we need to be prepared for the long haul. That as Russia's defense ministry released footage of a warship armed with hypersonic cruise weapons holding exercises in the Norwegian Sea. Last week, Putin sent the frigate to the Atlantic Ocean armed with new generation missiles, 
and a signal to the West that Russia will not back down over what it calls its special military operation. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Bernard Arnault, the chairman and CEO of Europe's most valuable company, luxury retailer LVMH, has appointed his daughter Delphine to lead Christian Dior in a shakeup of top management that tightens the family grip on his empire. Arnault, who recently overtook Elon Musk as the world's richest person, will move the former head of Dior, Pietro Baccari, into the top job at Louis Vuitton, replacing longtime CEO Michael Burke. Shares of the company rose as much as 2% to hit new highs following the news. Delphine Arnault has worked at Louis Vuitton for the past decade alongside Burke and previously spent 12 years at Dior. The company said in a statement that Burke, who is Bernard Arnault's longest serving lieutenant and has also been chairman of jewelry label Tiffany, will continue to work alongside the 73-year-old without detailing his new role. One of the fashion industry's most influential executives, Burke oversaw soaring growth at Louis Vuitton, the world's largest luxury label, playing a key role, for example, in elevating street styles to the realm of luxury in recent years. The reshuffle, which comes into effect in February, follows the recent appointment of Antoine Arnault, Bernard's eldest son, to head the family's holding company. Arnault Sr. has shown no signs he plans to step down soon, and the company last year raised the maximum age of its CEO to 80 from 75. All of his children hold management positions at the company, carefully groomed by senior executives as they move up the ranks. Alexander Arnault is in charge of products and communication at Tiffany, while Frederick Arnault is CEO of Tog Heuer. The youngest, 24-year-old Jean Arnault, heads marketing and product development for Louis Vuitton's watches division. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic, and Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking, and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar, and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes and trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. China's business confidence has fallen to its lowest level since January of 2013, 
according to a survey by World Economics on Monday, reflecting the impact of surging COVID cases on economic activity with the abrupt lifting of many pandemic control measures. The index fell to 48.1 in December from 51.8 in November, the lowest since the survey began in 2013. The results were among the first indicators of how business sentiment has taken a hit in the world's second biggest economy after the sharp relaxation of strict COVID containment measures on the 7th of December, triggering a still growing wave of domestic COVID cases across China. World Economics said that the survey suggests strongly that the growth rate of the Chinese economy has slowed quite dramatically and may be heading for recession in 2023. China's GDP is expected to grow just 3% this year, its worst performance in nearly half a century. Right now, Calkine is offering a 7-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The survey showed business activity fell sharply in December, with the sales managers' indexes in manufacturing and service sectors both below the 50 level. China has recently dismantled some key parts of the world's toughest anti-COVID curbs and lockdowns. The measures were championed by President Xi Jinping, but impaired the economy and sparked popular protests unprecedented in his decade-long rule. The top leaders and policymakers will focus on stabilizing the economy in 2023 and stepping up policy adjustments to ensure key targets are met, according to an agenda-setting meeting ending on Friday. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The French economy is set to slow sharply next year in the face of an energy price shock, but should recover some lost ground from 2024. That's according to the central bank that was forecast on Saturday, revising down its outlook slightly. The Eurozone's second biggest economy is on course to slow from 2.6% growth this year to only 0.3% in 2023. The Bank of France said in an update of its long-term economic outlook, trimming its 2023 forecast from 0.5% previously. However, with the outlook highly dependent on gas supplies, a recession could not be ruled out, adding that growth next year could be anywhere between minus 0.3% and 0.8%. That was lower than and the 1% growth forecast the government has built into its 2023 budget, a target that a finance ministry official said remained confident was within reach. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The central bank said that once the energy price crisis eases, growth was expected to pick up, reaching 1.2% in 2024, 1.8% in 2025. Previously, it forecast 2024 growth of 1.8%. On inflation, the central bank estimated a peak in early 2023 and an average EU harmonised rate next year of 6% followed by 2.5% in 2024 and 2.2% in 2025. The European Central Bank has raised its interest rates four times 
most recently by 50 basis points on Thursday as it seeks to contain surging price pressures. In light of the weak growth outlook, the Bank of France forecasts the budget deficit would widen from 5% of economic output to this year to 5.4% next year. The government expects it's an unchained fiscal shortfall. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Italy is set to scrap part of its plans to facilitate cash payments for goods and services after criticism from European Union authorities, according to Economy Minister Giancarlo Giorgetti. In its draft 2023 budget, the government had proposed changing the current system in which sellers risk fines if they refuse to accept card payments by saying no penalties would be imposed for transactions below 60 euros. The move drew criticism from the European Commission, which said it was not consistent with previous EU recommendations to Italy to boost tax compliance. And Jurgetti told Parliament late on Sunday that the government had backtracked. The minister said that Italy intends to eliminate the measure on points of sales and some sort of compensatory measures may be introduced to help shopkeepers pay the commission fees on card transactions. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. But critics say that cash payments encourage tax dodges in a country where around 100 billion euros in taxes and social contributions are evaded every year, according to Treasury data. The current fines, which amount to 30 euros plus 4% of the value of the transaction, were one of the conditions for a 21 billion euro tranche on the EU's post-COVID recovery fund money that Rome secured in the first half of this year. Despite the latest developments, Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, who took office in October, continues to be the more indulgent towards cash than her predecessors. Her first budget, which must be approved by Parliament before year's end, raises a limit on cash payments to €5,000 from next year, up from a previous ceiling of 1000 Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Cafe Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFT's? Well do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage from Kalkai Media.
Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine Media. Today's guest is Griffin Trelaw. He's a CFO and co-founder of Clooster. With the Ethereum merge scheduled for September, we're all looking for more insight into what's going to happen to the crypto space after this major event. In a volatile market, investors are keen to find guidance on direction of trades and cryptos to invest in, and it's important to do thorough research in market fundamentals and economic factors that could impact the markets. So as much information and insight we can gain into the space from experts will only help us in our own search for the best investments that we can find. So today's expert, Griffin Trelaw, is specialised in crypto analysis and will share insights from his business, Krista. Welcome to the show, Griffin. Hi, Saves. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure being here. Oh, thank you so much. Um, what are you noticing, if we can jump straight in? I know you're probably really busy. What are you noticing in the changes that are occurring leading up to the merge of ETH 2.0. It's been talked about for so long. Do you think things like gas fees should be decreasing after it happens and maybe the use of more layer two scaling solutions? That's a fantastic question and no, I agree with you. Yes, gas fees in theory after this upgrade uh, should theoretically decrease. However, the, the merge is simply just a consensus change from proof of work to proof of stake. For, for the viewers who, uh, who don't know what that means, uh, proof of work uses miners or a hash rate to validate chief consensus, whereas the proof of stake mechanism refers to the process of staking the native tokens of the network used as collateral by staking operators to achieve consensus. Now, roll-ups uh, essentially assist this scaling by compressing transactions into a single transaction and then posting that onto a layer one. I'm going to get a little more technical here, so please bear with me. Uh, after EIP4844, now EIP is an acronym for ETH Improvement Proposal, that essentially is to make the cost of roll-ups cheaper by making it less expensive to post proofs on the layer one. We have two brilliant articles on roll-ups uh, posted on Substack by Cluster Research that I'll happily post after this stream. Now, um, two examples of roll-ups are StarkNet and Optimism. StarkNet is a zero-knowledge roll-up that uses zero-knowledge proofs to compress these transactions, whereas Optimism is an optimistic roll-up that also uses fraud proofs to compress transactions. So, in theory, uh, gas fees will not really lower post-merge. This is actually a common misconception. The fees will be lowered through upcoming hard forks after the merge, which is going to allow for these hard forks to occur. Okay, thank you so much. Well, that's definitely clarified something for us. Now, you've inspired me with that. Has Ethereum ever had to transfer the maximum amount of transactions it's able to so far or is it still just theoretically a number that they've suggested that they're able to cope with on the blockchain at any one time? So Ethereum in its current state is doing more transactional volume than Visa itself and that is while it's still using proof of work. As we scale to proof of stake and this merge occurs, in theory with upcoming hard forks it's theoretically possible for Ethereum to scale up to 100,000 transactions per second or, or more. Uh, it's also these additional mechanisms that will be introduced, such as EIP-1559, uh, that will then make Ethereum deflationary. So in theory, the, uh, if more transaction fees are being burnt than the block rewards generated, then the supply of Ethereum will be diminishing over time, therefore making it more and more scarce. Now, the purpose of this was to, to make Ethereum more deflationary in times of high network activity. As the merge occurs, it can then handle that network activity, making the asset a better overall investment as the, uh, and as the meme says, it is ultrasound money in that sense. Yeah, ultrasound money. Wow, that's definitely a term that I've heard before, but I've never really understood it. So you believe it's the fact that it's becoming more deflationary and more useful as a mode of transaction. Is, is that correct? Correct, correct. This will all be allowed post-merge, and then as future hard forks are implemented, it will then allow Ethereum to start scaling more, handle more transactional volume and network activity, and then ultimately, if... Um, 
if transaction fees are, are being burnt, it also becomes deflationary too. So it's uh, it's an amazing asset. Uh, look at it like digital oil to, to the older generations that uh, are trying to wrap their head around this. Uh, it is going to power this next sort of digital economy, this financial system that moves online. And I, I honestly believe that Ethereum will be leading this charge. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, and it's not just the older generation who are trying to wrap their head around it. I'm trying to understand what's going <laughs> on here as well, trying to keep up. <laughs> so thank you for that. Now, what do you think will happen to the staked Ethereum that was previously required by the miners to use proof of stake consensus? How do you think this will impact ETH's price? That's a very good question because I was looking into that myself recently. Now, the, the staked Ethereum won't actually be unlocked at the date of the merge, which I believe is intended to be around the middle of September, September 15th. Um, the unlocking of the Ethereum will likely be six to 12 months later through a different upgrade. Um, in that sense, that could create some short-term volatility as Ethereum is released back into circulation. Uh, economics does dictate that as the supply increases, the demand should decrease. So um, that just sounds like another opportunity to, uh, to, to look at Ethereum if it does become cheaper and more supply into circulation. However, uh, I don't see that lasting too long before demand picks up again and the, uh, and the price of Ethereum rises with it. Okay, thanks for that. So moving along. What do you see as the main difference between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum? I heard you know, uh, mention hard forks earlier. That's when, if I understand correctly, another blockchain breaks off from a main blockchain such as Bitcoin. If you can clarify that in a moment, that'd be great. And how can people avoid being scammed by other similar sounding protocols such as Ethereum Classic to Ethereum? Okay, um, don't sell yourself short, Sage. You, uh, you know a little more than you think. So a, a hard fork is essentially you're, you're splitting the chain to allow for an upgrade. Now, uh, if we rewind back to the first half of that question, uh, Ethereum Classic, uh, that is the original chain which was forked following the DAO hack. There really isn't a risk of being scammed here. The only real risk is sending Ethereum Classic tokens uh, to an Ethereum address and, and vice versa, right? So. Ethereum Classic still uses a proof of work chain. I don't see that changing anytime soon, which of course will please the miners. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, miners are the one using uh, GPUs to, to, to validate these uh, transactions. It's a consensus mechanism and they then get paid um, uh, Ethereum or, or Ethereum Classic as new blocks are minted. Now, a better question might be why miners are, are forking the proof of work chain so they can still mine Ethereum post-merge. And that's likely so they still have a chain to mine on and don't have to move across to Ethereum Classic altogether. Essentially, after the merge, we'll have three types of Ethereum hard forks. We'll have Ethereum, ETH proof of work, and Ethereum Classic. So uh, if, if you want my expert opinion, I would go with Ethereum because it's the most robust and abundant chain. It has the most activity, it has the most developers, and therefore it makes sense to, uh, sorry, to, to follow the strongest chain moving forward. Wow, thank you very much for clarifying that. So it sounds like there's going to be a lot of Ethereum mining rigs that are going to go obsolete. Is that true? Do you have any insights to share on what's going to happen with those rigs? I mean, the, the rigs themselves can always switch to different cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum Classic. Uh, they're going to be keeping Ethereum proof of work as well, so they don't have to ditch the Ethereum chain altogether. There are other coins such as Ravencoin, which you can still mine. I believe that had a halvening uh, a year ago. So miners will still have many, many opportunities to continue mining coins and, um, and validating transactions as far as proof of work goes. Uh, ETH itself, you'll still have the option of, of mining it. However, the token itself will just, instead of, be called, uh, sorry, instead of being titled ETH, E-T-H, uh, it would be E-T-H-P-O-W for proof of work. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Um, so back to the mainline discussion. Is it true that Coinbase could halt Ethereum withdrawals the day of the merge? And how will this impact investors, please? Okay, so that's a standard practice with many, many exchanges that, uh, that follow these upgrades. So uh, yes, investors should still be able to trade on Coinbase itself. So the, the impact will be minimal. Like I said, it is a standard practice whenever a coin is doing an upgrade or a, or a rather mar uh, a large upgrade at that. So 
why they do this is to just reduce the exposure to customers in the case, uh, sorry, in the case of something going wrong, and that way their assets won't get stuck or lost. It's more a preventative measure, if anything. Okay, thanks very much for that. So as we start to wind up the discussion, do you see Ethereum flipping Bitcoin as the largest crypto by marking cap in coming years? And do you have any tips for us on cryptos to keep our eyes on? For sure, for sure. So mm -hmm. uh, another great question. I, I am an ETH maxi. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it goes to say, yes, I do, I do believe that the Ethereum uh, market cap can eventually flip that of Bitcoins. Now, the reason I believe that is because it already has flipped Bitcoin on every other major metric except for price. Now, uh, flipping Bitcoin's market cap will probably happen last. And, and the reason for that is because ETH is always expanding. New protocols are being introduced. The, the innovation itself, network security and, and soon scalability. It's, it is the only cryptocurrency to inherently solve the blockchain trilemma meaning that it's decentralized, secure, and scalable. I, I don't know another cryptocurrency to date that can keep up with that. And um, like I said, it's the network that has the most activity on all fronts. It's the most secure and soon to be one of the most scalable, if not the most scalable. So if it's already hand handling the, the transactional volume of Visa and more, uh, who knows how much more volume it could handle. Uh, once this merge and future hard forks uh, occur moving forward. So, yes, I'm, I'm uh, an ETH maxi for those reasons, and uh, I, I do see it actually flipping Bitcoin's market cap uh, because it, in effect, solves the blockchain trilemma, and that's why cryptocurrencies exist. Okay, thank you very much for that. And just before you go, any cryptos we should be keeping on our watch list as we enter the second half of this year? I knew there was something you'd want at the end of this. So, um, yeah, there are a couple that I'm keeping my eye on. Obviously, I want to avoid um, anything relating to financial advice. However, um, a, a couple of cryptocurrencies I'm keeping my eye on are, uh, are GMX. Now, that's a, a decentralized derivatives exchange that pays fees to its holder. Another one is Matic or Polygon. Now, that is um, building scaling solutions for Ethereum and, and, and was one of the first to deploy a, a zero knowledge roll up. So you want to look for projects that, that complement the Ethereum ecosystem moving forward. Uh, another one is Synthetics SNX. That's one of the first players in the DeFi space and, and following DeFi. Chainlink is another one you'd want to keep an eye on. That is the largest Oracle provider in all of crypto, which is a very important infrastructure that allows additional protocols to operate. Lastly, and, and following um, our talks of the NFTs and, and metaverse, I'd be keeping an eye on Mana, Decentraland, and uh, sorry, Decentraland, and Engine E N J. They are ETH-based metaverse coins, and, and obviously need no introduction. Following the um, the, the previous talks, and uh, as the metaverse keeps expanding, and, and big companies such as Meta plan on establishing themselves uh, themselves in this metaverse, Mana and Engine are, are really sort of setting themselves up properly to um, to benefit from this moving forward. So those would be the cryptocurrencies I keep an eye on. Uh, Ethereum would be the, 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 the most prominent of those five or six that I've mentioned. And then you do want to participate with some exposure to altcoins. However, um, the, the majority of your of your portfolio should be allocated in the more established cryptocurrencies such as such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Thanks so much, Griffin, for making time to appear on the show today. And as the bear does continue to swoop on the markets, uh, hopefully we're seeing all this institutional investment going into these coins and building up some great use cases for these crypto projects that hopefully we'll see in due time some excellent traction. I think the crypto market cap globally did increase today, so that's good news for people who are interested in the sector. Was well, there anything you'd like to add before you go? Yeah, buy, buy low, sell high. That's as, <laughs> that's as far as the <laughs> adage goes. Uh, as more and more institutions get into this space, uh, they will want cheaper prices. So use this time in the bear market to, uh, to learn how to trade, uh, understand the fundamentals underpinning the market. You will have plenty of time. And um, as far as the market cycles go, you, you do have the benefit of the Bitcoin halvening cycle that occurs every four years. Uh, we had the most recent one in, in 2020. The next one is scheduled for 2024. So you have at least two years to understand this market, uh, observe prices as they go through this bear market, providing better buying opportunities and really set yourself up to, uh, to benefit from that next halvening cycle, which will occur in 2024, 2025. 
Thanks so much, Griffin. Enlightening definitely was a word that sprung to mind during that discussion and really do appreciate your time. Likewise, thank you so much for having me here today, Sage. And if you just joined us, we had a very informative, stimulating discussion with Griffin Trelaw. He's a CFO and co-founder at Cluster. That's Q-L-U-S-T-E-R, if you're wondering. And you can catch the full interview at Calkine Media's YouTube channel. Please keep watching for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine Media. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. As we come to the end of 2022, let's take a look at four UK listed star stocks that have gained heavily on a year to date basis as of the 13th of December 2022. First on the list is Medic Clinic International PLC. Medic Clinic shares gained nearly 56% on a year to date basis as of 13th December. The company expect increased client activity to drive further revenue growth, margin expansion and improved earnings in the 2023 financial year. In the financial year 2023, the company expects a combination of volume growth and efficiency gains to continue to drive the group towards the pre-pandemic profitability alongside a meaningful improvement in earnings. The group also expects the positive momentum in revenue growth margin improvement and earnings of the financial year 2022 to continue in the financial year 2023, driven by increased client activities supported by expected underlying economic growth in all three regions. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data driven market insights combined with an in depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Next on the list is Shell PLC, which is engaged in oil and natural gas production. Shell shares gained nearly 35% on a year-to-date basis as of 13th December. Shell recently in December announced the pound, sterling and euro equivalent dividend payments in respect of the third quarter 2022 interim dividend, which was announced on the 27th of October 2022, coming in at 25 cents US per ordinary share. The company is set to release its fourth quarter results and fourth quarter interim dividend announcement for 2022 on the 2nd of February 2023. In November, Shell Petroleum NV, a wholly owned subsidiary of Shell PLC, reached an agreement with Davidson Kempner Capital Management LP, Pioneer Point Partners and SAMP Pension to acquire 100% shareholding of Nature Energy for nearly 2 billion US dollars. In April of 2022, Shell Overseas Investment BV signed an agreement with Actis Sol Energy to acquire 100% of Sol Energy Power Private Limited for $1.55 billion and with it the Spring Energy group of companies. Next on the list is BP PLC, which is engaged in the global energy business. BP shares gained nearly 33% on a year-to-date basis as of 13th December. Recently, on the 9th of December, BP confirmed the current status of its business and interests in Russia. 
The company said that on 27th of February 2022, BP's board decided that BP would exit its 19.75% shareholding in Rosneft and its other business in Russia. The company also added that the decision remains unchanged and BP has no intention of returning to business as usual in Russia. For the third quarter in nine months of 2022, the company reported that the debt was reduced to $22 billion, while the company reported a loss for the quarter being $2.2 billion compared to the profit of $9.3 billion for the second quarter of 2022. In September 2022, BP announced that it agreed to sell its upstream business in Algeria to any, including its interests in the gas producing in Aminas and in Sala concessions. Lastly on the list today, Pearson PLC, which is a British multinational publishing and education company. Pearson's shares gained nearly 52% on a year-to-date basis as of 13th December. In October 2022, Pearson secured European private equity firm IK Partners as a subtenant at its global headquarters. In its 2022 nine-month trading update, the company said that the group's underlying sales are up 7%. Full year sales and adjusted operating profit expectations were reaffirmed. The company also said that they are on track to deliver at least £100 million sterling of efficiencies in 2023, which will accelerate improved margin expectations from 2025 through to 2023. Well, with that, we've come to the end of this video. Do let us know your thoughts in the comment section and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and also do press that bell notification to be sent upcoming videos. Thanks so much for watching. Sage for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Shares in Australia's star entertainment group tumbled nearly 12% on Monday after the New South Wales government proposed to raise taxes on casino poker machine operators in the state from July next year. The potential gaming tax changes, which will affect Star's operations in Sydney, which made up half of its revenue in fiscal 2022, according to its annual report, could raise an additional $364 million over the next three years if implemented. New South Wales Treasurer Matt Keane said on Saturday the money raised will be used to help fund vital services like helping communities recover from the impacts of COVID-19, bushfires and floods. The move comes amid increased efforts to reform Australia's gambling industry, which has been rolled in damning reports of sidestepping anti-money laundering rules, dysfunctional governance and poor corporate culture. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Star Entertainment Group said in a statement on Monday that it had not been consulted by the New South Wales government on the matter and that it is seeking to urgently engage with the government as to the sustainability of the proposed tax changes and the impact on the star's business. The company's shares hit their lowest since April of 23rd, 2020. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, 
the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkine. Hello, I'm James and thanks for tuning in to Kalkine TV for the Daily Crypto Catch. The United States Securities and Exchange Commission has said it has charged Genesis Global Capital and Gemini Trust Company with illegally selling securities to hundreds of thousands of investors through their crypto lending program. Genesis, a part of Digital Currency Group, entered into a deal with Gemini in December 2020 to offer customers of Gemini an offer to loan their crypto assets to Genesis in exchange for earning interest. Beginning in February 2021, they raised billions of dollars worth of crypto assets from investors. The firms violated securities laws through the offer and sale of crypto assets through their Gemini earned product, according to the SEC. In November 2022, Genesis told investors they could not withdraw their crypto assets due to volatility in the crypto space and the resulting liquidity crunch. At the time, Genesis had about $900 million in assets from 340,000 Gemini-owned investors. However, the investors have been unable to withdraw their assets. Investigations into other related violations remain ongoing. Moving on to market news, and Bitcoin climbed 7.29% in the past 24 hours and was recently trading at just above $18,861 US dollars. Meanwhile, Ethereum gained 5.06% from this time yesterday and was recently trading at $1,420 US dollars. As for today's winners and losers in the altcoin space, Aptos token grew 23.1% in the past 24 hours to trade at 6 US dollars and 39 cents, whilst Frax share token gained 18.42% to reach 6 dollars and 54 cents. On the losing side of the coin, ApeCoin dropped 1.43% overnight to $4.86, US whilst Nexo token fell 2.08% to $71.34. US All prices are accurate as of 1.05pm Sydney time, according to CoinMarketCap. Alright, that's all for this edition of the Daily Crypto Catch. Stay tuned to Kalkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. I'm James, signing off for now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Kalkai Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on Genus, a company started by an Aussie dad with a green app for kids that's been trialled in 40 schools. Today, I have with me the co-founder and director of Genus, John Owen. Welcome, John. Great to have you with us today. Thank you very much. So, John, could you tell us about Genus? What can you tell us about the app? Yeah, so we're addressing the most pressing issue of our time, you know, avoiding climate catastrophe. Now, what does that mean? It means that we're running out of time to save the planet. Unfortunately, our kids know this too. 
And they're a smart generation. They're highly engaged. They want to help, but they don't always know how. Plus, let's face it, sustainability has got a bit of an image problem. Kids see it as hard and boring or an adult problem. And uh, we basically want to change that. You know, so our app provides fun things for kids to do, online challenges, games, quizzes, that sort of thing. But the difference with Genus is that we send them out into the real world to perform real world missions that drive real world impact. This is about the kids saving the planet for themselves. It's about the future and it's about saving the planet for the generation with most at stake. Well, it sounds fabulous and very exciting for kids and parents also. Where did the idea come from? Uh, well, I was watching a documentary, a nature documentary with my kids, and there was a section about habitat destruction and climate change. And my kids asked me, why is it like this? And I answered that, you know, a lot of adults don't understand climate change and things like that, and some just don't care. And at that point, I was like, if the adults are like this, what chance do the kids stand? And at that point, we're, I was like, we've got to do something about this. The stakes are too high. So if we're going to engage kids in sustainability, you know, we need to make it fun. So I watched a, a TEDx talk about gaming to solve real world problems and all the pieces fell into place. You know, you've got to make it fun for them. They're a digital generation, so it's got to be online. So we introduced principles of gamification like awards, levels, competition, that sort of thing. But it has to mean something in the real world if anything is going to change. So we send them out to do these mini missions that have a positive impact on the planet. It's about rewarding the kids and it's about making it a positive journey. It's such an important issue of our time. Now, a recent survey by medical journal The Lancet of 10,000 children and other young people aged 16 to 25 years across 10 countries, and that was including Australia, found that 59% were very or extremely worried about climate change and 84% were moderately worried. So mm. what do you think about those figures? Well, it's clear there's a, a whole generation growing up worrying about the future of the planet. You know, as a dad, I'm not okay with that, you know. I don't want my kids growing up with this existential dread about the future. And that's exactly what Genesis is about. It's about giving them hope. It's about giving them agency. It's about showing them how they can take control and live more sustainably. So, yeah. Now, let's just talk about financials, if we can. Now, you have some raised plans. You're looking for around 800,000. What do you expect to do with these funds? Uh, essentially, it's all about taking us to the next stage. You know, we've made a great start. We've built an engaging platform full of amazing activities and loads of curriculum aligned resources for you know, teachers to apply lessons in school. Um, uh, but we need to develop our product even more. You know, we want to introduce things like Roblox and Minecraft and other metaverse applications, uh, and this takes money. Um, so we're, we're at the cutting edge of what kids want to do, but we need to keep ahead of the curve. Um, and also we need to develop the market. So we need to get uh, our brand out there, get our messaging out there, and invest in sales development and customer acquisition. Absolutely. So what are the future plans for Genus? Are you looking to grow globally? Ultimately, yes. Australia is our launch market. You know, we're going to learn here, learn quick and then move fast. You know, ultimately, we want to make Genus the biggest possible business. And, and this is for two reasons. Number one, you know, the more kids and families and teachers that use the platform, the greater and uh, the positive impact we can make. You know, the more kids that use Genes, you know, the more the next generation is growing up thinking about and acting on behalf of the planet. And secondly, while the missions and activities, you know, are t you know target small scale personal acts of sustainability with enough kids on it, you know, this starts to become a systemic movement. This is generational change that we're targeting. So the bigger the business, the more impact we can have. And that's really what we're targeting. Sounds fabulous. Very exciting space to be in now. That was co-founder and director of Genus, John Owen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media, so make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkai Media's crypto buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. 
Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar, and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calcai Media. A group of investors has tabled resolutions urging four of the world's top oil and gas companies to set broad climate targets for 2030, reviving pressure on the sector after a year that saw governments shift their focus to energy security. Activist group Follow This said it had co-filed the resolutions with six major institutional investors managing $1.3 trillion in assets ahead of the annual general meetings of BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Shell next year. In the resolutions, the investors call on the companies to set targets to reduce by 2030 greenhouse gas emissions, including those from fuel sold to customers known as Scope 3 emissions, which account for the vast majority of the sector's pollution. Investors have in recent years ramped up pressure on the oil and gas sector to help tackle climate change and the follow this climate related resolutions have drawn growing support among shareholders. However, last year the efforts largely sputtered as investors turned their focus more to higher energy prices and energy security following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. BP, Shell and Chevron have all set some 2030 greenhouse emissions reduction targets that include Scope 3, though Follow This said they are not aligned with the United Nations ambitions to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. Exxon has yet to set any 2030 Scope 3 target. The group of investors co-filing the resolutions includes Edmund D. Rothschild Asset Management, De Groof Peter Kem Asset Management, and Acmea Asset Management. Follow This did not provide the names of the other backers. Shell, BP and European peers, including Total Energies and NI, have set out strategies and targets to slash emissions to net zero by 2050 by reducing oil and gas output and growing low carbon and renewable energy businesses. In the United States, 2022 saw a wave of efforts driven by Republican politicians and right-leaning investors to focus executives' attention away from environmental, social or governance themes. Activist investor Strive Asset Management, for instance, is seeking a shareholder vote at the springtime meeting of Chevron to reverse a Scope 3 emissions reduction mandate. Exxon and Chevron have in the past successfully blocked attempts to file climate resolutions with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.
Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Sunday that protecting Ukraine's borders was a constant priority and that his country was ready for all possible scenarios with Russia and its ally Belarus. In one of his nightly video addresses, Zelensky stated that protecting our border, both with Russia and Belarus, is our constant priority and that the country was preparing for all possible defence scenarios. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Zelensky made his remarks on the eve of a visit to Belarus by Russian President Vladimir Putin amid discussions of a possible new offensive by Moscow and suggestions it could originate in Belarus. In his address, Zelensky issued a new appeal to Western nations to provide Ukraine with effective air defences. He also said his forces were holding the town of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine where some of the fiercest fighting has been seen to date. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. South Korea on Monday flagged a deeper economic slowdown than expected at least through the first half of next year and extended sales tax breaks on some fuel oil products and passenger cars by a few months. The government is expected later this week to announce its economic policy strategies for next year, which will be the first four-year statement for President Yoon suk yeols administration since its launch in May. South Korea's economy, the fourth largest in Asia, relies heavily on exports ranging from cars and ships to chips and smartphones. It's widely expected to see growth fall below 2% next year from close to 3% this year. The central bank last month cut its projection for next year's economic growth to 1.7% from the previous 2.1% in its scheduled revision, citing falling exports and the resultant reduction likely in corporate investment. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. As the economy now has to rely more on domestic consumption to offset the cooling export demand, the finance ministry has extended by as much as six months tax breaks on fuel oil products and passenger car sales beyond their original end 2022 expiry. The ministry is due to unveil its 2023 economic projections and strategies on Wednesday. President Yoon, struggling against low approval ratings, says exports are the best choice for the manufacturing heavy country to overcome its slump. The problem is that China, South Korea's top export market, is facing its own problems as its economy feels the impact of years of strict controls to fight COVID-19. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Molly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.
In a year marked by global monetary tightening, recession concerns and a conflict in Ukraine, many stocks have performed quite well. In this video, we're going to take a look at one such stock that has gained more than 500% since the 1st of January 2022. Turkish Airlines has gained around 544% on a year-to-date basis as of the 16th of December. Turk Havayolari is a Turkey-based company which provides passenger and cargo air transportation services. It operates under the following business segments, which are air transport, which consists of mainly domestic and international passenger and cargo air transportation and technical maintenance services, aircraft repair and infrastructure support, related to the aviation sector. In 2022, Turkish cargo continued its strong growth trend over the last decade by building on its market share gains during the pandemic. Their incorporation increased its cargo revenue by 140% during the first nine months of 2022, compared to the same period in 2019. According to the International Air Transport Association, Turkish cargo has strengthened its success by ranking fourth among air cargo carriers in August. In February of this year, Turkish cargo moved cargo operations to its highly technological new hub, Smartest. Turkish Airlines finished the third quarter of 2022 with a 1.5 billion USD net profit. The company's total revenue during the third quarter of the year was 6.1 billion USD, surpassing the same period in 2019 by 52%. Cargo revenues increased by 110% compared to the same period in 2019 and were recorded as approximately 880 million American dollars. In the first nine months of the year, their incorporation carried 54 million passengers, reaching 96% of the 2019 level. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Additionally, in the nine months of 2022, Turkish Airlines ranked first among the European network carriers in terms of flights, according to the European Organization for the Safety of Air Navigation. The company has also decided to purchase six A350 to A900 type passenger aircraft from Airbus to be delivered this year and next. Now you can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon for video notifications. I'm Rachel for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Kalkine Media's crypto buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi, and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. Welcome to Expert Talks by 